In his Notes Towards Martial Codification, section 4.1.9, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, Rubut Gulliman, remarked that battle is not a state to be entered into lightly. Battle is always painful, and always comes at a price. So the astute commander never commits to battle unless no other options remain. Once that commitment is made, once the phase of execution, or primary condition, has begun, it must be done with the utmost efficacy. A rapid application of overwhelming force to obliterate your enemy as quickly as possible. Do not give him the time and space to react. Do not leave him with any materiel or opportunity that he can use in a rallying phase. Eliminate him physically and psychologically so that his threat is entirely removed. Kill him with your first shot. Utterly annihilate him with your first strike. This may be considered the application of attack in its purest form. The irony of such an understanding, given what was to unfold, is lost to none. Certainly not even he who committed it by stylus to record. Penned at a time when the Great Crusade was at its zenith, Notes Towards Martial Codification is a preparatory work for the Primarch, which is not to say it is not robust. Quite the opposite, it is one of the finest works of the era, entering easily into military theoretical canon alongside surviving works by Antaxis, Maculius, and von Clausewitz. It is in many ways a highly foundational step upon the 13th Primarch's road to his defining work, the post-heresy Codex Astartes. It is also an embodiment of Gilliban's detached clinical writing style, the treatment of the chaos, insanity, and sheer bloody horror of war as a problem to be solved by the application of a stern mind and keen will, bereft of any of the emotion that actual warfare sets aflame within any human the moment they fire a gun or pick up a blade. It is redolent of a Gilliman writing from a place of absolute surety, both in the theoretical, practical mindset adopted by him and his legion, in the supremacy of his tactical mind, and in the security of the world he inhabited and his place within it. Codification is a relic of a time when the Primarch looked forward to days where such a document would be simple theory of a necessity long since past of hopes of a galaxy without war, where a mind such as his could be bent to the building of a civilization rather than its imperialistic military expansion. That Gilliman died, along with the ideals he once dreamed possible, in the fires of a great betrayal, alongside the sons he sought to uplift. That Gilliman burned in the fires unleashed by he who he thought brethren those who he thought kindred. That Gilliman, he who penned notes towards martial codification, is lost to us forever. The Imperium he dreamed of, even more so. Know then, that this is a record of the vengeance of a legion, of a crusade cast in shadow, of the death of a dream, a record of the Betrayal at Kalth. The Betrayal at Kalth has nothing in the way of a single beginning. It was a myriad of ways, products of decades of enmities and bitterness, plans and machinations, and detached strategic necessities. It was a confluence, a meeting of demands emotional, military, and arcane. This macro-alignment a pleasing thing indeed to those who planned the atrocity and their dark patrons. Parsing out the strands of these beginnings is necessary for as complete an understanding of the catastrophe as possible, but when doing so, one faces a myriad of barriers. The complexities of the pieces in motion, 
the devastation wrought on history by the passage of this war, and the vested interests of those who catalogue the records in its aftermath. The sources one draws upon for this chronicle were in large part saved due to the habitual diligence of the Ultramarines, 13th Legion Astartes, committed as they were and yet remain to learning all possible lessons even an atrocity of this magnitude could provide. From the battle itself, its aftermath, to the years of rebuilding and scouring that followed, the eventual cessation of hostilities in the volume, the 13th Legion extensively documented Calth and all combat actions that took place in and around the Viridia system, in the hopes that future generations of Imperial citizens may avoid such calamities as had been committed against them. One particular source, a foundational one for any discourse regarding this event, funnily enough comes from a Gloriana-class battleship named the Chronicle of Ash, bound to the 17th Legion word-bearers, captured by the Ultramarines in 017M31, three years standard after the Siege of Terra. The ship, defended by a mere handful of support cruisers, had seemingly spent the entirety of the heresy and the years since reaving its way through the eastern fringe. Her capture was a boon to the Imperium in many ways, rather than simply ending the threat that she posed. Her massive internal halls were covered in their entirety with what appeared to be the sum total history of the Word Bearers Legion and their accomplishments, penned in spidery runes of dead Colchis. For years, the earliest members of the Inquisition painstakingly catalogued the writings, parsing out secrets hitherto unknown to the Imperium and transcribing them into tomes that would later be sealed under maximal security protocols and inviolate mimetic defenses, lest the taint so profound amongst members of that damnable legion be transmissible through their runic language. Few commented on the profound and twisted mirror the Chronicle of Ash represented. Just as the Ultramarines had endeavoured to learn all they could from Kalth, so too had the word-bearers sought to document and record their own history of the event, for purposes altogether of more dread intent. For the word-bearers, the origins of Kalth are twofold. The first, and most natural, is the Dropside Massacre at Istvan V, at which the Legion was present and, according to some apocrypha, the first to open fire upon the unsuspecting Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamander's loyalists they had been meant to reinforce. On that world's black sands had the opening salvos of the heresy truly been fired, the War Master Horus Lupercal breaking the compact of brotherhood that had been the Legionia's Astartes, and plunging the galaxy into a civil war the likes of which had never stained the stars. Despite the breaking of three whole legions, despite the scattering of their shattered remnants far and wide across the Imperium, despite nine legions firmly at his beck and call, the War Master yet held no decisive military advantage. The disaster of dealing with loyalist elements within the original four traitor legions during the betrayal at Istvan III, and the defiance of the surprised yet furious loyalists at the Dropsite Massacre, had stymied the War Master's progress, just enough to deprive him of the total surprise he would have needed to seize core Imperial systems and Terra itself with minimal resistance. The delays, coupled with those loyalists that had managed to flee the massacres, most notably those aboard the heavy frigate Eisenstein, meant that the Imperium and the Emperor would eventually come to learn of the treason, sooner than Horus could reach Terra. There would be no quick victory. Once roused, the Imperium would raise mighty armies in retribution and shore up its defenses against him. Potentially billions of loyal soldiery would stand between the War Master and the walls of the Imperial Palace, to make no mention of Horus's brother Primarchs and their own legions. Of those that had fallen on Istvan, the Tenth Legion Iron Hands and their now dead Primarch Ferris Manus was a grievous loss to the Imperium indeed, 
But for all their loyalty, they, and the sundered 19th Legion Raven Guard and 18th Legion Salamanders, were never the largest of the Legiones Astartes. The latter two, in particular, ranking as amongst the smallest in terms of numerical disposition. Opposing Horus would now be the largest of the legions that were not pledged to him. The Blood Angels rivaled his brother Perturabo's Iron Warriors in size, and Horus knew within his hearts that the warriors of Sanguinius would, in a straight fight, likely be worth more than the dour corpse grinders of the fourth. The Lion's First Legion Dark Angels, despite still recovering decades after their mauling at the hands of the Xenos Rangda, were lethal beyond the capabilities of any other legion, and yet formidable in numbers besides. And then there were the Ultramarines, the noble 13th of Rubut Guliman, vast beyond all others, some 250,000 Astartes at least, and possessing an industrial and recruitment base that could be ramped up to astonishing capacities in scarcely any time at all. These were paramount threats. The Loyalists had lost one Primarch, missing two more, and were deprived of three entire legions, yet numerically, the remaining were more than enough to tip the scales against Horus if left unchecked. The War Master had, of course, foreseen this potential eventuality, and had bent his machinations to tempering the threat that Loyalists could pose to him. Knowing he nor any of his traitor kin would not possibly be able to sway the loyal brethren that yet remained to his camp, he sought instead to ensure their ability to reap vengeance against him was compromised in the fullest of ways. To the Dark Angels, he assigned purgation operations in the Thramas reaches, far to the galactic east, at the very edge of the Emperor's light. Seeking to simply remove the Lion and his sons from the board for as long as possible, by placing them as far away as possible. The Space Wolves had already been maneuvered into the burning of Prospero, bleeding them horribly, and were currently licking their wounds, wandering into the coils of the traitor Alpha Legion, who were also attempting to pin down their mercurial Fifth Legion White Scars. The Blood Angels were dispatched to a grand trap in the Cygnus Cluster, arranged in concert with the War Master's never-born allies from beyond the Veil of Reality. The Ultramarines required a far more direct approach. The 13th Legion had, since their reunification with their Primarch, expanded massively, creating for themselves an impressive empire within an empire, the 500 Worlds of Ultramar. Despite its location in the further Eastern Galactic volumes, the Realm of Gilliman was perhaps the most successful of any within the Imperium beyond the core systems surrounding Terra itself. The Primarch's peerless logistics, acumen, and vision had seen him play the statesman as much as a military leader, concerning himself with the work of building a society within his father's empire as much as winning worlds for it. Ultramar was a shining light in the dark, the proverbial city upon the hill. It brought colonists to the eastern fringes in astonishing numbers, buoyed by healthy land allotments promised to Imperial Army servicemen mustering out of their tours, as well as inviolate borders protected from Xenos Reavers by the unassailable might of the 13th Legion. It was in many ways the promise of the Imperium made manifest, a safe, stable, and prosperous realm, where all worked for the betterment of the whole, delivering to those loyal a life free from the generational terrors of old night, albeit at the cost, as with all imperial worlds, of bulldozing non-compliant populations with genocide and cultural obliteration. Because of all this, it provided a phenomenal base of operations for the imperial military. The Ultramarines had a wider base for recruitment than any other legion, not even speaking to the genetic stability of their gene seed and the subservient populations. The colonial might of the 500 worlds additionally supplied millions of troops to the Exertus Imperialis. Numerous knight households were pledged to the realm, and several titan legions, foremost amongst them the Honorable Legio Presagius, 
maintained close ties with the Forge Worlds of the Volume, Konor and Gantz. Horus was keenly aware that, once word of his rebellion spread, Ultramar would function as a loyalist fortress, within which potential billions of army troopers and tens of thousands of Astartes would be raised and set against him. With geographic location in the Galactic East placed it on his flank for any push towards Terra from the Warmaster's holds in the northern reaches. Ultramar and its legion must simply be broken. This was a task the 17th Primarch, Lorgar Aurelian, and his legion, the Word Bearers, were only too ready to commit to. The enmity between Legions 13 and 17 was decades old, born of the actions of the Word Bearers and the role of the Ultramarines in bringing them to task. Subsequent to their reunification with Lorgar, the 17th Legion, once the Imperial Heralds, had been rechristened the Word Bearers. Transformed from the iconoclasts burning with the fires of the Imperial Truth into the proselytizers of the worship of the Emperor as divine. While this history will be elaborated on in greater detail in a subsequent record, suffice it to say that, at least initially, the annals of the Great Crusade record the Emperor as having offered no rebuke to Lorgar's behavior, even though it was in direct violation of his own writ, his own laws, and his plans for the human species. Or rather, that this was not done openly. Writings from Lorgar's brothers recovered from this time revealed that the Emperor had shared his disquiet with the 17th's activities with his son privately, yet to obviously no avail. The situation appeared at least tolerable until the pace of the word bearers across the Great Crusade began to slow eventually grinding to a near standstill, as the Legion invested ever more time and effort into compliance operations that focused nearly entirely on converting the population of rediscovered human worlds to religious worship of the Emperor and his Imperium. By the time word had spread amongst the Divisio Militaris of the 17th Legion's violation of both Imperial law and their commitments to the Crusade, the Emperor was already moving. In 963 M30, he dispatched the Ultramarines, with Gilliman at their head, to raise utterly the city of Monarchia on the planet Kerr, an icon for Lorgar and his legion of all they had accomplished in the name of the Imperium and their god Emperor. The legion, summoned to the ashes of their work, were forced as one by the Emperor to kneel before him in censure. The shame, announced by their god, and before the eyes of the Ultramarines who stood above them in judgment. A mirror held up to their weeping faces of the Astartes they should aspire to become. The censure became widely known following the raising of Monarchia. It was, no doubt, meant to be. Publicly visible shaming in full view of all. A reminder that the Emperor's grace had its limits, even for those he counted as his sons. The word bearers were now cast as low as any of the Legiones Astartes had ever been, save for the total purgation that had befallen the 10th and 11th legions, only thanks to the Emperor's mercy. Forever now they were the bearer not merely of his word, but also his reprimand. As far as history records the aftermath, Lorgar withdrew into contemplative seclusion, long enough that there were rumours that the Emperor would rebuke him yet again, but eventually emerged in possession of a fervour hitherto unseen in the Seventeenth Son's actions. Few thought anything of this, but we of the Dark Future know the truth. Within that seclusion, and thanks to his subsequent pilgrimage, Lorgar Aurelian had turned to new gods, old and terrible, ones he deemed worthy of his worship. The Primordial Annihilator, Chaos, the Dark Gods of the Dread Pantheon. The shame of Monarchia, the arrogance of the Ultramarines, those burned within the hearts of the Primarch and his sons, even those who had not yet knelt before the Master of Mankind. 
The raising had entered Legion myth as the greatest crime committed against them, the resentment fueling their apotheosis into devotees of the greater intelligences of the warp. It is likely the plans drawn up for Kalth and the 17th's advance into Ultramar in general were developed between Lorgar and Horus acting in concert. It was, of course, mutually beneficial. Horus knew well what drove his emotional, tempestuous brother, and sought to yoke his own plans to it, while Lorgar saw the perfect opportunity to advance the aims of his war master, his gods, and the reaping of vengeance against his hated brother in one singular swoop. Just as the 17th Primarch had been instrumental in the corruption of Horus and the eventual enactment of the Dropside Massacre, so too was the planning for the betrayal launched far ahead of Istvan V's Black Sands. Orders for the Grand Muster of the 13th Legion were issued to Gilliman as early as 005 M31. Warp horologues record the Primarch as having departed Saturn only scant months before the Eisenstein brought word of the War Master's betrayal to that same system. Owing to the chronological vagaries of the Warp, and the fell influence of Horus's new patrons, word from the wider Imperium bled away as the Ultramarines forged a slow and winding path from the Imperial core back to Ultramar. Appearing for all the world as a markedly severe, but not entirely unprecedented, upsurge in immaterial storms, Gilliman paid the disturbances little heed, assured that the Imperium and his 500 worlds had many a contingency for the continuance of operations in times of raging etheric storms. Passage was slow, but manageable, and communication yet possible with the disparate elements of the 13th Legion, now ordered by their War Master and Primarch both to gather at the planet Kalth in the Viridian system in their near totality. The muster was, of course, purposeful. Intelligence had reached Horus, he claimed, of a Xenos threat, that of the Gashlak orc warboss and his empire. Bordering that of Ultramar and the Viridian system within which lay Kalth and her shipyards. Having suffered the predations of the orc menace in decades past, this was a credible reason for concern. That Gilliman, the Ultramarines, and any of the Ultramarian military strategos had scried little Xenos activity on their realm's borders was raised by few. The intelligence came from the War Master, and the military leader of the Imperium would of course have access to more detailed reports. The Ultramarines would preemptively annihilate this Xeno hold, and they would not do so alone. By Horus's order, the Purgation expedition would be conducted in concert with the Word Bearers. The reasons behind this were obvious to any who beheld the simple outline of the operation. This was a move by the newly minted War Master to cement his authority. Who else would have the goal to order the Ultramarines to gather in their entirety, the largest and nearly most successful of the Emperor's legions? And then there was the history of the legions concerned. Well known, well established, the Primarchs had little love lost for each other, and neither did their sons. But, after all, was this not a new Imperial era? The Olinor campaign had marked the end of true existential threats to the Imperium. The Empire and its Astartes were looking forward now to the future, and to what form that future would take. Was it not time to bury past disagreements, and forge new brotherhoods? The War Master was taking two legions at odds and forcing them to work together despite their apparent wishes. It had all the hallmarks of the blunt, well-meaning, and at the same time keenly observant Horus Lupercal. Here was the perfect opportunity, no doubt, to bury the proverbial Gladius. Feelings amongst the Ultramarines at all levels were quite mixed. The more idealistic of the Legion looked forward to an opportunity to move beyond the years of the past, some openly delighting in what they may learn from the 17th Legion, a force that had appeared to have truly changed in the decades since the censor. Others were more choleric. This was pageantry, they opined, or worse, charity. 
granting the word bearers a chance to win some glory on the coattails of the 13th Legion, who would of course be doing the real work of the campaign. Yet others, of a more practical mien, decried the ludicrous overkill the upcoming purgation represented. There was simply no way the Xeno hold of the orcs required the material strength being committed. Not merely two legions, but their primarchs as well. Whatever the political considerations, surely this was simply too much. The politics of it all were obvious, and simply paved over. Gilliman saw this all for what it was, and nevertheless resolved to its commitment without protest. Seeing the value in renewed brotherhood, and ceding to the authority that his brother Horus was still clearly needing to project. Of course, the true intent behind the muster was only made obvious in dreadful hindsight. Indeed, the Gashlak Xeno hold, as presented by Horus to the Divisio Militaris as a massive threat to Ultramar's sanctity, is likely to simply have never existed at all. Investigations subsequent to the heresy revealed little in the way of evidence for any orc infestation in the volumes outlined by the War Master's missives. At best, several Xenos raids on the fortress world of Galsoria can be verifiable across records at the time, but of the supposed war boss Gashlak, nothing can be verified in documentation that did not have Horus's direct involvement in creating. Given what occurred, it is likely that the threat was entirely fictitious, serving to simply justify the removal of Gilliman and the bulk of the 13th Legion from the Imperial Core Worlds, and placing them in the path of Lorgar and his own schemes. That the Imperium would be warned of the treachery of the fallen legions was an eventuality now assured. Despite his fury at being robbed of complete shock, Horus was well aware that this had been a possible outcome, and had taken such into account. The first terrible acts of the heresy at the Istvan system had been accomplished. The traitors yet possessed the element of surprise, and a phenomenal capacity to affect confusion and disinformation in order to prolong the early stage of advantage. The fragile communications infrastructure of astro-telepathy was vulnerable to both capture, with traitor operatives ensuring the largest choirs in the surrounding volumes were silenced, and etheric disturbances, which were brewing at frightening speed and intensity in the aftermath of the Istvan atrocities. This, given Horus's new gods, has been supposed as being a part of some dark compact, the greater intelligences roiling the currents of their realm to speed the passage of their minions and deny that of their foes. The disturbances spreading from Istvan's position in the Galactic North reached further and further outwards smothering the furbile dreams of astropaths galaxy-wide with a fugue state of nightmarish phantoms and malign portents. The surest word of treachery was carried, essentially alone, by loyalist craft fleeing the catastrophes that had befallen them, and these were ever dogged by ravenous traitor pursuers. Sometimes, even in instances where they had managed to reach loyal worlds, too often did they find no means of passing their tales of betrayal to higher authorities, and that traitorous ships breached the warp impossibly soon after they themselves had only limped back into real space. By 006 M31, the Hand of Horus began to emerge, stretching over systems in the Galactic North in the first moves of building his Dark Empire. Even as the first steps of the Warmaster on his long, bloody road to Terra were being trod, a combined armada of the 17th Legion Word Bearers and 12th Legion World Eaters was making astonishingly good progress towards Ultramar. Under the command of Lorgar and the 12th Primarch Angron, they made a segmentum-breaking force, even despite the wounds suffered by both at the Istvan atrocities. The World Eaters, as precipitators of the ground war during Istvan III, had bled significant manpower, but those that remained were truly hardened killers, not to mention now twice blooded in combating fellow Astartes. The word bearers supplemented their cousins' material strength considerably, having utilized the years since Monarchia to vastly swell their numbers in an effort to match that of the hated Ultramarines. 
They had also ensured to amass one of the largest void fleets of any legion, possessing at this stage over a hundred capital ships, including nine Gloriana class, several of which had only recently been captured as prizes from the now shattered legions in titanic void clashes above the Dropside Massacre. To supplement this were three Abyss-class super battleships, the Trisagian, the Blessed Lady, and the Furious Abyss herself, considered to be amongst the most powerful void ships ever constructed by the hands of mankind. The fleet of the World Eaters was somewhat lesser in terms of sheer tonnage, but had a storied reputation for aggression, and was outfitted accordingly, favoring viciously fast frigates and pursuit vessels armed with the vicious, iconic Ursus Claws, designed to ensnare and deliver legionaries in bloody boarding actions. Led by the 17th's Fidelitas Lex and the 12th's Conqueror, the Armada carried some 300,000 Astartes and innumerable auxilia, both in the form of Imperial Army regiments and degenerate warp cults inducted by the word bearers. Their route is distressingly easy to trace. Their path was marked by a string of totally devastated systems, gruesome waypoint markers for the passage of the traitor brothers. There is little discernible reason for the choice of worlds the Armada was unleashed upon beyond simple proximity to their route. No capture or conquest was undertaken. No forces were left behind as garrisons. Populations were simply slaughtered. What slaves were taken appeared to be few. The fate of these poor worlds were marked either by butchery at the hands of the world eaters or human sacrifice by those of the word bearers. Death was either fast, a body broken in two by a chain axe, or slow, skin flayed, and blood drained atop an altar to eldritch powers. A great number of profane ritual arrangements of corpses constructed by the 17th Legion serve to mark precursors to the atrocities committed in Ultramar, and it is highly possible that these gruesome votive offerings were undertaken to speed the fleet on its way southwards. As history records it, the first Ultramarines to die at the hands of the 17th and 12th's so-called Shadow Crusade were a garrison force on the world of Anorum. A military outpost initially seized by the 12th Expeditionary Fleet on its long march to Ultramar, the world had later been fortified and manned by the Ultramarines as a way station for the movement of Crusade fleets throughout the Galactic East. It was heavily manned its garrison consisting of a full company of ultramarines, enough to capture an entire planetary system with ease, as well as several regiments of solar auxilia, recruited from the advanced industrial cities that dotted the world. A robust, flexible force, the envy of many a crusade-era operation. They died in less than a day. Angron was recorded as having personally led the attack, demolishing all resistance before him and putting the world to the torch in under 24 hours. But the killing dragged on for weeks, as blood-mad world eaters hunted down survivors alongside the Gal Vorbach, the so-called blessed sons of the word bearers. Glutting themselves both in human lives and armament stock, the armada of the two Primarchs at this point disappears from recognizable Imperial space. It is presumed that the route they took forward passed through the forbidden region of galactic space known to the Cartographica Imperialis as the Dominion of Storms. Such a route would ordinarily only be undertaken by the mad or suicidal. The volume is riven with warp disturbances, currents, and anomalies of exceptional ferocity and unpredictability. That the fleet's passage was even possible at all is entirely due to paranormal interferences and patronage. Even still, the records of the Chronicle of Ash attest that the journey was fractious. Angron and his legion, growing weary of the lack of victims for their bloodthirst, wasted excessive time hunting for worlds to prey upon. 
Lorgar and his brother almost came to blows on more than one occasion, as the Yurizen sought to keep Angron on target, only to be saved by an attack mounted upon the Armada by Eldari ships in the depths of the Xercinia prohibited zone. In a stark and unexpected boon, the Chronicle of Ash penned it as a gift from the Dark Pantheon, for Lorgar was gifted with prophecy by an Eldari seer, albeit unwillingly, concerning the fate of Angron and Aurelian's own part within it. That, however, is a dark and terrible tale for another record altogether. By 007 M31, the borders of the Xercinia prohibited zone had been reached by the ships of the Shadow Crusade. The volume, the nominal border of the Dominion of Storms and Ultramarian space, presided over by Kalth herself, was an ideal staging ground. A quarantine zone enacted during the Great Crusade by the Titan Legio Tempestus, Xercinia was a plague region. An ancient and utterly lethal Xenos pathogen had been inflicted upon the Crusade fleet that had attempted to purge Eldari maiden worlds therein, capable, seemingly, of circumventing void shields and atmospheric locks. No ship was permitted access, under penalty of destruction by Ultramarian picket fleets that regularly patrolled the border. Lurking within, the traitor fleet avoided detection utterly. Put simply, absolutely no one was looking for them. Dates here are uncertain. It is quite likely that the fleet emerged fairly staggered, as even by a passage sped by patrons unnatural, no armada of this size could maintain coherency of formation for that long a journey, making a period of consolidation quite necessary. As the greater fleet reassembled, Reaver flotillas were doubtless dispatched into Ultramar border regions. A sudden upsurge in missing ships at this point in history, logged as disappearances chalked up to warp anomalies, have been revised historically as victims of the Shadow Crusade. Some recovered logs even attest to navigators being lured off course by false beacons, assumed now to have been word-bearers warpcraft meant to usurp the etheric sight of these mutants and trap Imperial ships to their doom. Those captured were utilized for intelligence gathering. Their bridge crews, mind broken by word-bearer diabolists, the traitors extracting as much as they could about the status of Ultramar's shipping patrols and Kalt's defenses. Well aware that, by now, even with Gilliman delayed, the muster would be well underway. The information was vital to shoring up the traitors' plans for the system. While the defenses of the world, and of Ultramar itself, were no secret to the legions, them still being counted as brothers in arms, no legion would ever fully divulge its entire strength, especially after the burning of Prospero. Kalth, of course, was not the only target. With hundreds of captive captains shorn of all intelligence they could render, the Shadow Crusade began to subdivide. The two Furious Abyss-class ships, Trisagian and Blessed Lady, formed up with the Fidelitas Lex and the Conqueror to make the core of one of the main thrusts, set against the war world of Armatura, the most fortified planet in the entirety of the 500 worlds after Macrag itself. The hub of the region's military might, Armatura was the center of the Ultramarine and Exertus Imperialis mustering and training, making its destruction as central to the entire traitor agenda. Lorgar and Angron themselves would see to this. Kalth was left in the hands of Erebus and Kor Phaeron, first chaplain and first captain of the Word Bearers, respectively, leading the majority of the Word Bearers' fleet with all of its Gloriana class ships. A hundred small flotillas were dispatched across all compass points, formed of the pack hunters of the World Eaters, and what remaining destroyers and barks could be spared from the Word Bearers. All with the intent to winnow and bleed whatever ultramarine or navis imperialis ships they encountered and inflict as much infrastructural and population destruction as they could. There would be, in all cases, absolutely no attempt made to capture territory, 
nor even any efforts to strike at strategic targets. Kalth and Armatura were the only ones of note, and the only ones in play. The Shadow Crusade was unconcerned with worlds like Konor, Eax, Gantz, or Espandor. Not when there were hundreds more agri-worlds, industrial centers, and fledgling colonies with nothing in the way of defenses for them to glut themselves upon. Its first and foremost aim was death, bloodshed, and terror. Every cruelty, every crime, every ounce of malice must be committed upon the civilians of the 500 worlds, with as much psychopathic creativity as could be mustered by those enacting it. The suffering of Ultramar's people was the aim. Fuel for Lorgar's sorcerous schemes, and vengeance for a legion still holding in their hearts the shame of Monarchia. As the fleet separated to bring about their murderous rampages, Erebus aboard the Destiny's Hand and Corferon aboard his own capital ship, still broadcasting her old ident tags of rapturous Rex, made wake for the muster at Kalth. The betrayal would soon begin in earnest, and it would do so with but a single ship. Historical records frequently debate on the precise beginnings of the Battle of Kalth. As one has discussed in the previous record, the roots of the catastrophe stretch back into the Great Crusade itself, with the 13th Legion's role in the humbling of Lorgar at Monarchia. More recently than that, there was the necessity of removing the Ultramarines and their Primarch from the proverbial field in the early days of Horus Lupercal's grand treachery. The progress of the 12th and 17th legions towards the realm of Ultramar was marked by a string of genocides and slaughters, including of the Ultramarines themselves at the planet of Anorum. Any of these points could serve as the true beginning for the Battle of Kalth, but in the strictest analytical terms, as defined by the Ultramarines themselves, Records of the engagement begin at just under 137 hours before Primarch Rubut Gulliman ordered the return of fire. The fleet tender Campanile, an auxiliary naval vessel serving as logistical support for the 13th Legion's armada, was seized at the Tarmus Apogee, deep in the Viridian system's far space, by cult followers of the word bearers and presumably several of their esoterists. She is considered from this point in official logs, albeit only ones compiled in the aftermath, as lost with all hands. This includes the 3,709 crew members, the shipmaster, the navigator, as well as, laterally discovered to have been aboard during Ultramarine's post-mortem investigations, two Mechanicum Fabricators, a Kalth Portmaster, and a small detachment of the Neride Regulator's 10th Infantry. The vessel was usurped through means unknown. Her destruction at the beginning of the battle annihilated all trace of her at an atomic level, meaning no log box could ever be recovered. Approximately 45 minutes after what can reasonably be established as her moment of capture, a course irregularity was logged by Kalth System Control. The Campanile had strayed from her prescribed course. Another was logged 45 minutes after that, and another 7 hours later. Contact from the Vox is lost at Kalth Mark minus 99.21.59. The last transmission, recovered in scorched data stacks from the orbital wreckage of Viridian Anchorage, sounds suspiciously like human screaming. Two hours later, Kalth System Control tags the tender with a cause of concern ident, but given the sheer volume of in-system traffic at the time, the master of the port does not escalate it further determining 
that if for whatever reason the Campanile's course is not corrected, or contact re-established, a picket bark will be dispatched to intercept, but only if neither condition is met by the end of his watch shift. The Campanile is at this point one of approximately 192,000 ships in the Viridian system's local volume. Eleven hours after the final Vox is heard, the fleet tender resumes coded transmissions and corrects its course. The master of the port cancelled the concern tag and resumed his work monitoring the rest of the fleet conjunction. The Campanile's crew were long dead. But they were still screaming. Located in the Viridian system, at the outer edges of Ultramar, Kalth was a young world, settled only three generations before its death in 007 M31. It was, however, one of Gilliman's 500 worlds, and thus the beneficiary of the full might of the Ultramarian wing of the Imperial Engine. Possessing a fairly uniform subtropical climate, Kalth was an ideal candidate for human colonization, rendering fertile river valleys for crops as well as sufficient mineral resources for a stable industrial base. Rapidly becoming self-sufficient, Gilliman was known to have referred to the world as an uncut gem, primed to become a planet known not only throughout his own volume, but across the Imperium. It was a world of promise, growing more rapidly than any planet in the 500 worlds. Kalth represented the promise of the Imperium as defined by Gilliman himself. Biographers of the Primarch have noted that, during this period following his brother Horus's ascension to the rank of War Master, Gilliman was working diligently at establishing foundations of his role once the Great Crusade had reached its conclusion, or at least what he foresaw as his role. It was a time that the Primarch clearly saw as both imminent and inevitable. Intent on proving that Primarchs and their legions could play a part in a galaxy freed from the necessity of war, Kalth was for Gilliman a symbol both of what he could do and what he was doing. This is likely part of the reason for the massive influx of investment Kalth received. The world would be a beacon, perfect candidate for colonial drive pamphlets, iterator speeches and imperial propaganda reels. The planet's infrastructure was perennially a decade ahead of its population, and was maintained that way. Kalth was ever preparing for more people than she had on her soil. Subterranean tunnels, a facet of the planet's geomorphology, had been vastly expanded and filled with arcologies, massive structures housing millions of workers, with space for millions more. The arcologies were both an excellent means of population management and a necessity for survival upon the world. The Viridian system's star was prone to bouts of solar storms that caused intense coronal mass ejection events. Every 15 years, Terran standard or so, Kalth was bathed in intense radiological waves, making the underground habitats a necessity, but thankfully doing little harm to the world's biosphere, the native flora having long since adapted to process the radiation that habitually deluged them. Kalth orbital space was likewise incredibly built up. Extensive orbital shipping docks, repair facilities, and logistical support stations made up what was, at the outbreak of the heresy, the largest shipyard in the entire 500 worlds, making it a rival for the largest shipyards in the Imperium. It was these facilities that made Kalth the objectively sound military mustering point for the current endeavor. In what was to become known as the Kalth Conjunction, the combined fleets and Astartes at Arms of the 13th Legion Ultramarines and 17th Legion Wordbearers would gather for a purgation campaign against the orc Xeno hold of the war boss Gashlak. The conjunction was a staggering feat of military logistics. The Ultramarines were the largest of the Legion as Astartes by a considerable margin, numbering some 250,000 Astartes under arms. 
The Legion gathered a total of 185,923 of that number at Kalth alone. This included the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 6th, 9th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 16th chapters in their full disposition, the 8th, 14th, and 15th chapters, numbering some 6,000 Astartes each after heavy combat casualties in recent engagements, the 17th, 18th, 23rd, and 4th chapters, the latter known as the Aurorans, comprising of heavy armor specialists, and finally the 22nd chapter, the so-called Nemesis chapter, safeguarding the Legion's destroyer mark annihilation weaponry far from Kalt's population centers. Alongside the Ultramarines, in their planetside musters, were 118 god engines of the Legio Presagius, the true messengers of the Collegia Titanica, supported by the entire knight household of Vornherr, newly arrived from their homeworld of Lundborg IX. Finally, over one million soldiers of the Exertus Imperialis gathered alongside the Ultramarines. The overwhelming majority were new recruits. Given the nature of the campaign and the absolute certainty of victory, it was deemed by the Divisio Militaris to be an ideal testbed for newly raised Ultramarian army groups, including some of Kalt's own newly minted divisions. In Orbis, a significant quantity of the Ultramarian navy consisting almost entirely of frigates and heavy cruisers, but was additionally accompanied by Gilliman's personal flagship, the McCrag's Honor. Additionally, the Legion's 20th and 21st chapters, the Eagles and the Hawks, respectively, the latter being the finest air warfare pilots in the Legion, and the former, its paramount void engagement specialists, were stationed across Calth Viridian Anchor and the system's numerous defense platform stations, as well as several divisions of the Solar Auxilia from the famed 41st Espandor High Guard. The disposition of the word bearers is harder to establish. As Gilliman and the 13th Legion were expecting the near entirety of the 17th to arrive at the conjunction, preparations had been made accordingly. In actuality, it is believed the final commitment in Astartes by the word bearers to have been at some 50,000 Astartes, a third or a quarter of post Istvan V operational capacity, depending on your choice of estimates. Based upon picked captures, recovered corpses, and vox logs, the Legion committed elements from the following chapters to the commitment of the atrocity the inscribed, the trifold crown, the Osseous Throne, the Black Comet, the Third Hand, the Graven Star, the Asps of the Sacred Sands, the Twisting Rune, the Exalted Gate, and the Unspeaking. There was, apparently, no tactical rationale for the selection of units from these chapters. At best guess, it can be assumed they were either the personal preferences of Cor Phaeron and Erebus, the first captain and first chaplain of the word bearers and placed in overall command of the Kalth operation, or they were essentially suicide troops. No evacuation was laterally attempted by the word bearers of their Astartes in the aftermath of the Battle of Kalth. It can be assumed that those word bearers committed to the operation were selected to be martyrs, burned away perhaps for lacking devotion to the new calling of Lorgar Aurelian, or simply zealots committed utterly to the task. Deployed alongside the 17th Legion were some half million to one million auxilia of the basest variety. Appearing initially to be simply barbarian militias, these brotherhoods were rapidly revealed to be fanatical cultists enthralled to the Legion. The 17th was as well supported by some 130 titans from the Legio Infernus, who, until the moment of betrayal, continued to broadcast codes under their original cognomen, the Legio Certervora. A note on supplementary text. The majority of what has been discussed thus far, and will henceforth be examined, 
was made possible through the incredibly diligent record-keeping and codification work of the Ultramarines. 13th Legion, even in catastrophic defeat, were committed to learning everything they could from the Kalth atrocity, both about their newfound enemies and their own weaknesses that had been exploited in order to precipitate the slaughter. Ultramarine records from the entirety of the Great Crusade have always been freely available. The Legion, and later the Primarch, ensured that they were disseminated to all archives, be it military or civilian, that wished to house them, firmly committed as the Legion was to the betterment of the Imperium. Naturally, in the 10,000 years hence, the availability of these records has become somewhat diminished by inquisitive individuals. That one has access to them is considered a problem by some and a historical necessity by others. Regardless, to accomplish ease of examination, the Ultramarines employed what they referred to as the Mark, a timestamp that would allow specific reports from specific times during an engagement to be easily identified along a linear timeline. Noted in Terran Standard Hours Sidereal, the Mark allows anyone from an instructor to a historiator to refer to, for example, Orax Mark 12.16.10, referring to the 10th second of the 16th minute of the 12th hour of the Orax compliance. The Mark of Kalth is one of the more infamous, as it, alongside few others, is granted the dubious status of having negative timing. The seizure of the Campanile, for instance, is the earliest point upon the record, at Mark minus 136.57.07, albeit at best estimate. Typically, a mark will begin at a formalized moment, the issuance of a specific operational order by the commander, for example. For Kalth, it is timed at the instant Robot Gulliman ordered a return of fire against the word bearers. By the Primarch's later comment, everything before cannot stand in record as a battle. It was merely treachery. It should likewise be noted that the Mark of Kalth has an altogether different meaning for the veterans who managed to survive the massacre. It refers to solar radiation burns suffered by survivors, specifically amongst baseline human troops. Those that did not succumb to cancers and grand mal radiation poisoning made a tradition of refusing skin grafts. They continued, until their deaths, to wear the Mark of Kalth as a grim badge of honor. At Mark minus 124.24.03, the first of the 17th Legion's ships hove into high anchor at Port Numinous, the shipyard in geosynchronous orbit above Numinous City, one of Kalth's major population centers and a hub of the conjunction muster. Aboard her was the first word-bearer to make contact with the Ultramarines, one Sorat Tuchur, meeting Honorius Luciel, Captain 209th Company. The delegation was a point of honor. Luciel and Tuchur were two members of two legions that were quite estranged. Their meeting aboard the Ultramarines cruiser Samothrace was intended to be a reunion of two members of their respective legions who held one another in actual brotherhood. Relations elsewhere were strained, to say the least. By the Helm video feeds recovered, Luciel and Tuchur met amiably. Luciel was perplexed by the change in the word-bearer's armor. No longer was the 17th Legion arrayed in their grey plate. Now, it was taken by the hue of dark arterial red. Elsewhere in the system, the word-bearer fleet arrived in staggered formation. Their path through the warp was assumed to have been arduous. Imperial activity had been markedly more fraught since the Ultramarines began their own muster at Kalth weeks beforehand. 
While many within the Legion derided the word bearers for their inability to either arrive in good time, or at the very least manage fleet cohesion, there was a tendency amongst higher echelons of the Ultramarines to essentially pity the 17th Legion. They did seem to be trying their best, was the sentiment. A legion once rebuked by the Emperor himself, now ordered into battle alongside the one that was fast rising to become the Imperium's finest. The Ultramarine's own fleet was stationed in perfect order in various shipyards. Dozens of cruisers and heavy frigates were ensconced within the berths of Viridian Anchor. Reactors powered down, working on what repairs or optimization they could, given the chance to be at a superlative dry dock for longer, thanks to the word bearer's tardiness. Others yet orbited the yards, while in the outer orbital zones, the word bearer's ships began to gather, deploying heavy troop transports to the muster camps at the planet below. That their Astartes and Auxilia may be accounted for, resupplied, and rearmed by the industry of Kalth. The process was a long one. By Mark minus 61.25.22, the conjunction was increasing in scale. Erebus had arrived, requesting an audience with Primarch Gilliman, who declined it, preferring to wait for his brother Lorgar, who, by all accounts, had recently translated in system and was 17 hours away at sublight burn. Evox interrupt was recorded at mark minus 61.39.12. Initially attributed to a solar flare distortion, a common facet of the Viridian system's overactive star, the officer who logged it insisted that, for all the world, it sounded like singing. At mark minus 60.35.11, upon the night side of Kalth, the bad dreams began. There were other portents. What appeared to be chanting disrupted the orbital data feed net for precisely 11 seconds until it disappeared. An hour later, this happened twice more. Kalth Orbital Control issued a statement saying that owing to solar activity combined with the massive degree of Vox and data traffic caused by the conjunction, Communication disruption should be understood as ongoing until the source of the problem was identified. On the surface below, former Librarius Astartes, now serving in the line under the Edict of Nicaea banning the use of their powers, began to experience severe headaches. There were hundreds of them, and they all ignored the symptoms. Had any been within earshot, of the word-bearer militia camps, they would have also heard the singing. At mark minus 16.44.12, server of instrumentation Ul Kehal Hest, ensconced within the watchtower in Numinous City, logged that even his augmented brain was approaching capacity. The Mechanicum server had direct control over the Kalth defense weapons grid, 250,000 surface-based weapon stations, the void shields that were developed to protect Kalth's cities and arcologies, and 962 orbital weapons platforms. Such a system, the most cutting edge of Mechanicum technology, was intended to run on automated pattern recognition. Each arriving ship, each vessel that moves, or joins a formation, or docks, or begins an engine test, Every ship that moves triggers within the new spheric field a firing solution and a firing request. Every single non-standard thruster burst was detected by the grid and painted with target identifiers. Given the 190,000 ships in Kalth near space, everything from the Gloriana-class battleships to the most humble of fleet tenders, the system was producing a staggering amount of data. Hest was estimating that, at peak, he was denying the engagement of weaponry 25 times per second. It is at this mark that the first instances of scrap code 
were detected in Kalt's newsphere by senior Mechanicum adepts. Diseased information, junk data. Scrap code is an unfortunate byproduct of the intricacies of the machines of Mars. Internal process degradation produces it regardless of the diligence of those monitoring such systems. However, at this mark, the scrap code quantity was noted at being 2% over the acceptable margin, even given the already accounted for predictions by Mechanicum Analyticae. It was, by the standards of Hest and his staff, unacceptable, and they immediately moved to rectify it. Out in the system, at mark minus 14.22.39, the fleet tender Campanile makes a series of small course corrections, aligning her approach with Kalt's orbital volume. At mark minus 13.00.01, a previously somewhat acceptable six-minute delay in bulk orbital loader operations had exacerbated into a 29-minute delay. By ultramarine standards, it was abominable. The seneschal of the local trade committee was summoned by the present Legion command overseer, Remus Ventanus, to answer for the issue. The Seneschal reported that the higher-than-average concentration of scrap code was complicating matters beyond the standards that the Legion can deem acceptable. Aboard the McCrag's honor, the issue was raised to the Primarch, who resolved to bring it to Lorgar as a potential concern, in case his Legion, who had spent time under purgation campaigns in the depths of wild space, may have accidentally brought something with them. The initial hololithic communication between the two brothers was terse. Logar's apparent warmth, by the records of Marius Gage, reportedly gave way the second Gilliman raised the scrap code problem as having potentially been caused by the word bearers. The assembled 17th Legion command elements, Corferon, Erebus, Argol Tal, Hall Baloth, Fodral Fell, bristled alongside their gene father. Gilliman's seemingly simple point of order was taken, immediately, as a barbed jab right from the outset of the conjunction. Lorgar suspended the hollow transmission of his subordinates to accuse Gilliman of causing humiliation to his legion straight from the get-go, setting impossible standards for the word-bearers, who, by Gilliman's own record, had been fighting heathen conflicts in the depths of space for years. Only through the ultramarine Primarch's deafness with his words was the situation, seemingly, saved, and the Aurelian placated. Unbeknownst to those in orbit, or indeed anyone beyond the conspirators, foul Magi across Kalth, embedded within word-bearer auxilia units, had completed hundreds of individual, identical rituals, breathing to life eldritch corruption within the infospheric systems of Kalth. By minus 7.55.09, the final words were spoken, the final throats cut, and the scrap code became a problem the Mechanicum could not solve and would not solve. At mark minus 1.01.20, the fleet tender Campanile crossed the inner Mandeville point of the Viridian system, the final point of translation possible within the gravimetric bounds of planetary masses. Broadcasting to local picket ships, Viridius Maxim Starfort, and to the watch vessels of Ring 14, it submitted the full and correct anchorage codes. The crew long dead, scream with them. But they lack the mouths to do so in a way that can be heard by anyone mundane. Viridius Maxim Starfort, automatically approving the codes per standard doctrine, disengages its target firing solution on the tender and signals that she may begin her approach. The Campanile, at this point, appeared on all sensorium suites to be decelerating. At mark 
A teleport flare is logged by weather monitoring stations 2,000 kilometers north of Numinous City, in a frozen region logged by Cartographica as a Satric Plateau. Later investigations into the aetherical disturbances present in the Calt system has led many scholars to conclude that this was the location utilized by Erebus, first chaplain of the word bearers, for a grand dark ritual. It is believed that the chaplain was born to Calt's surface in that selfsame teleport beam. At Mark minus zero point two zero point two zero, the fleet tender Campanile crossed the inner defense ring. Embraced now by the masses of starships, monitor craft, orbitals, bulk loaders, mass conveyors, and thousands of other pieces of orbital traffic. Having passed within the orbit of Calt's sole moon, it fired its sublight drives to maximum burn. Abruptly, it began to accelerate. At mark minus zero point one nine point four five, Surat Tuchur murdered Honorius Luciel aboard the cruiser Samothrace. Luciel was the first Legion casualty of the atrocity. It was not a good death. Tuchur fired his plasma pistol at point blank range, catching the ultramarine in the torso with a bolt as hot as the innards of a star. Luciel, thanks to his Astartes biology, was alive for several more seconds, enough time to scrabble about the floor and attempt to stand, despite his torso having been cored and most of his internal organs having been turned to dust. Tuchur's second shot vaporized his skull. Just over a second later, the officer of the watch stationed on the Samothrace's bridge logged the weapon's fire as occurring. The watch officer responded by immediately dispatching the ship's armsmen, per standard protocol in such event, even if the arms fire is, of course, surely a mistake. Within four seconds of this, said officer has already initiated all procedures to lock down the deck. His response, had he survived to be credited with it, would have been considered exemplary. Had later events not transpired, the Samothrace would have been 35 seconds away from a complete lockdown of the company deck. Nearly perfect timing. At this point, every single alarm system aboard the Samothrace registered and blared. Collision warning, proximity, passive auspex, active auspex, course detect, primary orbital traffic, every single alarm spoke of something approaching. Something within the near orbital volume, moving completely against all prescribed codes, routes, paths, and protocols. What occurred next occurred at a speed beyond the capacity of any eye, human, mechanicum, or Astartes, to perceive. At mark minus 0.18.34, the fleet tender Campanile raised her void shields and accelerated her main real space drives to maximum output. She began to employ what in void fairing terminology is referred to main extending thrust, a condition used for full acceleration as a ship reaches speeds necessary to light its warp drives and breach the skein of reality that separates materium and immaterium. It is only employed on long-form approach towards a system's Mandeville point, across a distance that, at minimum, is half the radius of an entire star system. In short, it was at its maximum output, but because of the distances involved, the Campanile reached, according to recovered logs, approximately 40% of her theoretical real space velocity. She was moving so fast that she was only visible on higher-end sensors. Not even vidlog footage exists of what was to occur. It was simply moving too fast. Every single auspex grid in the inner system howls 
as they detect the sudden object acceleration. The crew of the Campanile, long dead, scream with them. Two microseconds later, the Campanile entered Kalt's orbital shipping belt. The fleet tender is now a bullet. Void shields lit, it first murders successive rows of freighters and troop conveyors stationed at high anchor. The shockwave of these calamities will, of course, in turn throw ships into each other like pathetic debris. The Campanile missed the frigates Lutine, Melatus, Cavascor, and yes, the Samothrace herself, by less than her own length. Likewise, the Testament of Andromeda and the battleship Ultimus Mundi were similarly spared, the tender having passed just below their beams. At this point, the Campanile was within denser traffic zones, plied by tinier single personnel craft, monitor fighters, lifters, and riggers. The gravimetric bow wave of the fleet tender swatted them aside, if they were lucky, smashing uncountable numbers into docking superstructures or sending them hurling out into the void. Those unlucky enough to be close to her approach were compacted nearly molecule thin by the unholy stresses of gravitic distortion. These casualties, thousands in number, bulk compared to the murder the fleet tender Campanile is about to commit. Ahead of her lay Kalth Viridian Anchor, the largest of the orbital plates within the system, a mighty construction of jetties, dry docks, manufactories, habs, and transfer facilities. Crowning jewel of the system's logistical and military might, a construct able to sustain whole fleets of ships while berthing yet more. It was over 300 kilometers across. The Campanile hit it directly. Moving at such velocities, the void shield impacting upon physical matter created a mutual annihilation event. The energy created was channeled into light, heat, and force. It vaporized instantaneously the entirety of the Neary graving dock, along with the cruiser Antipathy that had been within. The drives of the nine-kilometer ship likewise vaporize, the contained force within claiming approximately 6,000 lives in an instant. And, a picosecond later, another 30,000 engine seers in the manufactoria located alongside it. Arrestor silos A112 and A114 are destroyed, loosing from within the escorts Bernabas and Jericho Rex the ships suffering irreparable hull damage in the process. The fleet tender Campanile is still moving. Next in its path was Assembly 919, a spherical dock containing the Menace of Fortis, the Deliverance of Terra, and the Mechanicum Explorator craft Phobos Encoder. All three ships are immediately destroyed, the assembly yard was shattered like a glass ball dropped upon stone. A fragment of the Mechanicum Bark was catapulted into a nearby principal cargo facility, destroying in its path 168 small ferries and 49 lifter craft. Cargo containers are likewise flung into all corners of the volume, many becoming ensnared by the orbit of Kalth and beginning a fiery descent onto the planet's surface. The entirety of the Viridian Anchor has at this point felt the impact throughout its superstructure. The continued, relentless path of the Campanile caused a bow wave of internal explosions that tear throughout the shipyards. A storm of debris from those explosions is believed to have crippled the triumph of Eax and set fire to the entire seven-kilometer mass of the Aegis of Occluda. The light from the matter annihilation appeared almost hungry. So vast and expansive was it. It consumed the entirety of the Spirit of Konor, one of the mightiest battleships in the entirety of the 500 worlds. 17 kilometers of ancient starship vanishing into its constituent parts as the event consumed her. 
Ultramar Zenith Graving Dock suffered a complete failure to its internal gravimetric systems, shorn of its tethers from the main yard, and it simply fell out of orbital position. Inside it, the Grand Cruiser Androdamicus is tossed like a child's plaything. Her reactor was dead. She had no power under which to perform even the most minor of course corrections. Even if she had, it was too late. She simply fell away into the orbital void, becoming ensnared in the gravity well of the planet below. The fleet tender Campanile is still moving. The ship's shields, however, finally failed. It remained, of course, a solid projectile moving at a fraction of the speed of light. Two more slipways were consumed following the void shield failure, along with the ships nestled there. Its next murder was the data engine central hub of the whole yard, causing an immediate and fatal new spheric interruption that claimed another 35,000 augmented mechanical adepts through massive cranial shock. Billions of tons of physical force are still at this point contained within the annihilated mass of the Campanile. Its final act, if it can even be called such, was when its last surviving piece, the solid core of its rear drive section, spun out of its path through the Viridian Yard and impacted into the battleship Remonstrance of Narthan Doom, cleaving the vessel in two and causing its rear section to detonate as its drives failed. This atrocity has occurred in the space of less than a second. All that any who happened to be looking in the direction of Viridian Yard would have seen was a blinding flash before potentially losing their eyesight, as for a moment a new star appeared to be born in the orbit of Kalth. The light shock blew out the bridge viewer of the McCrag's honor, with attendant servitors registering in screeches the death of the new spheric core. Marius Gage, first captain of the Ultramarines, in command of the bridge, demanded a report at Mark minus zero point one eight point three zero. At the near exact moment, the physical shock wave of the fleet tender Campanile's murder hit the Ultramarine's flagship. It was, in a very real sense, only the beginning. Kalth Viridian Anchor was sundered, a broken demi-world ablaze silently in the void. This event was referred to by the word bearers and their debased allies, apparently both prior and subsequent to the atrocity, as the Ushkul Tu. In several archaic languages with common roots across tainted worlds, the phrase can be roughly translated as tribute star or offering sun, although this removes cultural connotations of sacrifice, potentiality, and imminent promise as represented by the breaking of a dawn. As with the many crimes committed by the 17th Legion during the Horus Heresy, the significance of the act was paramount to some over any tactical considerations. The death of Kalt Viridian Anchor was an almost mortal blow to the Ultramarines Legion, and a greater one to their fleet. Hundreds of thousands of lives had been snuffed out in less time than an eye could blink. Their deaths were not merely mundane. The word bearers placed great importance on the ritual heft of the act itself, and just as the dawn promises something greater to follow, so too did the Ushkul Thu portend an even greater sunrise to come. Yet for now, there was, to all onlooking, a new star in Kalt's orbit. Viridian Anchor had become a fireball of nuclear energy, a spherical orb of incandescence blazing radiation outwards into the local volume. Electromagnetic pulses of astonishing brutality had pummeled what remained of the communications grid, 
Killing almost all intership Vox and leaving what networks remained intact, choked with frantic calls for aid and demands for clarification. The outpouring of energy fire continued to swallow ships from nearby anchorage lines, just as debris from the force of the Campanile's collision spun outwards into the void, indiscriminately killing as they sliced through ships at maximal velocities. The best information anyone observing could establish is only that which their own eyes could behold. Only viewports aboard ship provided any clarity, and all that eyes can see was a false dawn where once before lay a shipyard. The conclusion, drawn from the stunned and appalled minds of orbital survivors, was reached broadly simultaneously across Kalth near space in the seconds following the Campanile's murder of Viridian Anchor. This was not an accident. This was an attack. No accident could have wrought such devastation. Not here. Not with the Mechanicum's peerless redundancies. Not with Gilliman's scrupulous safety standards. Somewhere in the Vox Deluge, the word Orc was uttered. A word that caught fire across those that managed to parse it from the chaos of the surviving communications net. Of course, the Orcs. The enemy had to have become aware of the conjunction, and, obviously, had launched a preemptive strike to prevent the Imperial Juggernaut from reaching its full muster strength. At Mark minus zero point eighteen point two zero, surviving ships had finally begun to power up their drives, shields, and weapons batteries, bringing vessels to an approximation of fighting strength in the face of what, surely, was a Xenos incursion. Such acts, of course, cannot be completed in such a quick time. The overwhelming majority of Ultramarine's Legion and Navis Imperialis vessels, aligned to Ultramar, had been reactor inoperative for repairs. Captains bellowed for their engine seers to light drives, and as weapons operators howled for firing solutions, a canny few sensorium adepts noted that, amongst the tumult, a new call sign had appeared on wavering auspex grids in the orbital volume. The word bearer's battle barge, Raptorus Rex, a veteran titan of the Great Crusade, was gone. In her position was a new ship, the same ship, bearing a new ident tag. She was broadcasting a new name. Infidus Imperator. This was the flagship of Kor Phaeron, first captain of the 17th Legion. She was the first to open fire. The entirety of her primary lance batteries struck the battle barge Sons of Ultramar amidships. The vessel was, at the time, attempting to light its shield batteries, although was, of course, unable to do so. The battle barge was reduced to a fireball in an instant. Drives on full burn, Infidus Imperator moved forward. In her wake slid the Crown of Colchis, who also opened fire. As did the Flame of Purity, the Spear of Cedros, the Camiel, and the Destiny's Hand. By Mark minus 0.18.10, 20 seconds standard following the Campanile's impact, the entire Word Bearer's fleet was firing upon the Ultramarines. At Mark minus 0.16.11, Robot Gulliman reached the bridge of the McCrag's honor to take what command he could of the situation. The flagship of the Ultramarines was blinded and crippled. Outgoing Vox was disabled, and its view screens were inoperable. What little Gilliman's Vox officers were able to inform him was that the word bearers were simply not on the emergency channels. Only ultramarine vessels were issuing distress calls, or attempting to establish a framework for the disaster. The 17th Legion ships were silent, 
and were firing. This was clearly visible through the McCrag's Honor's open viewports, all playing out in the dread quiet of the void. Gilliman was forced to conclude that the aggrieved Legion had, in whatever madness had unfolded, assumed that the attack on Viridian Anchor contained elements of Ultramarine's culpability, that the 17th, still wounded from the raising of Monarchia, assumed that the 13th Legion were at fault, and their only recourse was self-defense. Gilliman ordered all work to be diverted to the Lithocast systems, that he may raise his brother Lorgar and put an end to the chaos unfolding in Kalt's orbit. At mark minus 0 0.16.02, Captain Remus Ventanus, attempting to establish some form of order over the civilian loaders he had now found himself warden of, beheld a sight that others across the region were only just realizing was real. A shadow falling over Calcus Fortalis was not an atmospheric disturbance, nor even the waning of whatever light was just filling the skies not minutes before. It was a ship. It was falling. Falling backwards across the sky. Slowly, so very slowly. The sight was reported to have utterly unmanned many who beheld it. To see a void ship at such an angle, in such a fashion, was as uncanny as it was impossible, but it was true. It was real. The grand cruiser Antrodamicus, shorn from her shipyard moorings, was caught in the planet's gravity. And, while its plummet looked to all onlookers to be gracefully slow, it was minutes from an annihilating impact. At mark minus 0 0.15.50, it started raining battle tanks in Numinous City. From above the metropolis's muster, heavy lifter vehicles had been caught in the devastation of Viridian Anchor and had broken up in low orbit. They shedded their cargo into the atmosphere and, of course, the gravity well. The robustness of the armor within these holds meant that hundreds, if not thousands, of them survived the orbital plunge, only to impact upon the mustered ultramarines below with meteoric force. Glowing from atmospheric re-entry, their impacts sundered full ammunition banks, torching the tanks off with incredible force. Impacts became detonations. Shadow swords, fell blades, falchions, spartans, bane blades, every mark of super heavy tank the Imperium possessed pummeled Numinous City with greater force than almost any artillery bombardment the word bearers could have created. They were accompanied, albeit with not nearly as much physical devastation, by human bodies. Ripped from the shipyard, ripped from the ships. They did not possess the metal shells of main battle tanks. They did not survive entry intact. The rain of corpses, blackened, scorched, withered, impacted with what moisture remained within their bodies, bursting like bags of boiling blood. At mark minus 0 0.15.48, the Antrodamicus impacted the crust of Calth at Calcus Fortalis. As a starship, her hull was designed to withstand not only the gravitational shear of warp translation, but also weapons fire of the enemies of the Imperium. Despite the tremendous velocity picked up during orbital re-entry, the impact barely deformed her keel. Her stern impacted first, biting into the crust half a kilometer deep, sliding backwards as physics now dictated her path. The ground was split like a plow. The Androdamicus carved a massive path through the city two and a half kilometers wide, responsible for countless civilian deaths. The overpressure from the impact wave demolished buildings ahead of her actual path, a bow wave of annihilation. 
seconds into this destruction, the stress of the impact began to cause fractures in the hull, teeming outwards from the sternward point of impact. The Antrodamicus landed fully on her keel, the final impact shearing fragments from her superstructure off to cause yet more devastation. Fires tore through the vessel, burning it up from the inside even as it still continued its path. A quake shock, the planet crust itself rebelling against the torturous wound it had just received, began to level parts of the metropolis neither the ship nor even the pressure front had touched. As the earthquake reached the muster points in Numina City, it was joined by the sound of bolters. The word bearers Astartes planet side opened fire on the ultramarines mustering alongside them. At mark minus 0.14.20, Titan warhorns sounded over Numinous, as the Legio Certivora masks off and engines blaring their new names. Infernus opened fire on civilian and military targets alike. The slaughter in orbit on the ground continues for another 11 minutes. At mark minus 0.03.59, Gilliman is at last able to raise Lorgar Aurelian on Lithocast. Prior to the conversation, the Primarch has rebuffed calls from his first captain, Marius Gage, to order Return of Fire. Gage stated in record that even acting in self-defense, the word bearers were only adding to the death toll from what was still believed to be a Xenos attack and that this amounted to a grand crime. That even should the accident have occurred, more killing was not the appropriate response. Gilliman had refused his first captain's entreaties, believing even at that point that the 17th Legion's worst fears must surely have been realized, and insisting that the folly of Lorgar's sons would not be added to by his own Legion, even as thousands died with every passing second. What followed, the interaction between Primarchs, was brief. Gilliman begged his brother to cease fire, that this misunderstanding can be moved past, that some measure of peace could be salvaged from the devastation that had occurred. He stated that surely this had to have been a mistake. The 17th Primarch responded that, how could Gilliman possibly think that this was a mistake. Lorgar's last words in this transmission, overheard by Gilliman alone, but recorded by the Primarch for posterity, were simply, I am an orphan. Bereft of options, impossibly penned in, Rabut Gilliman was finally forced to issue return of fire. The Ultramarines were to defend themselves by any and all means possible. The officer of record present upon the bridge initiated standard 13th Legion archival protocol. The mark of Kalth began. 00.00.00. My brother, hear me. Warriors of the 17th Legion, hear me. This violence is against the code of the Legionnaires Astartes and against the will of our father, the Emperor. In the name of the 500 worlds of Ultramar, I implore you to cease fire and stand down. Open communication with me. Let us speak. Let us settle this. This action is an error of the most tragic kind. Cease fire. I, Rabut Gulliman, give you my solemn pledge that we will deal with each other frankly and fairly if these hostilities can be suspended. I urge you to respond. This message was placed on cyclical transmission at precisely mark 00.00.01 by order of the 13th Primarch. It was an attempt Gilliman noted in later writings collected in Alec Scovion's Tactica Occidentalis, an examination of storied campaigns of the 13th Legion during the course of the Shadow Crusade, 
to provide some degree of clemency. He laterally noted that his instinct to provide such was misguided, but nevertheless made under the ideals he yet held on to at the time. As the transmission was being broadcast, the 17th Legion fleet continued its murderous crusade through disabled ultramarine ships. Vulpines amidst the yard fowl, their kills were effortless. Gunnery officers aboard word bearers' ships simply annihilated whatever loyalist vessels they targeted. Even those that had fired reactors to some degree of efficacy were fighting blind and deaf. Paltry evasive maneuvers unable to slip from the firing solutions of word bearer ships that had been sitting in orbit 20 minutes prior with reactors fully stoked. The slaughter was unspeakable. The intricacies of each ship death barely recordable in the time it took to murder them. The support carriers Vosphorus and her sister ship Valediction were caught in the broadsides of a word bearer battle barge. The former, slightly shielded by the latter, attempted to flee, only to expose her drive section to lance fire. The ensuing explosion catapulted the vessel into the nearby troop transport, Antrophiles. The death of three ships resulted in 80,000 lives lost in a mere five seconds. This was just one of the executions carried out in orbit. Every passing minute added a dozen more. The flame of purity mounted an attack run on the further out Asteri's orbital yard, firing carronades at helpless docked ships even as her armoured prow ploughed bodily through support vessels in her path, a void cast battering ram heedlessly juggernauting through ships, structures, people. The corpses of vessels slain by the 17th Legion in this fashion found new homes in the decades and centuries hence. Those that were not caught in Calth's own gravity well, like the sundered Androdamicus, were flung into the void and ensnared by the system's star or planetary bodies in wide orbital paths. Cold and utterly dead, these hulks, at least initially, contained survivors, typically ship ratings and menials trapped in their innermost bowels. These poor wretches would never again see light. They died from lack of oxygen, or were frozen into shards of ice after life support systems gave out. It is believed hulks of this nature still exist in the gulfs of space in the Viridian system. Silent, dark, impossible to locate tombs of a thousands-year-old atrocity. With their false skins thrown off, the word-bearer fleet escalated their maneuvers from simple murder to grander atrocities. A formation of 17 planetary bombard craft led at the van by the Destiny's Hand, flagship of Erebus, took position over Kalth in low orbit. Breaking into pre-assigned pickets, the formation moved into geosynchronicity with predetermined population center targets. Such a course of action, had the still extant defense grid been operational, would have been impossible. But the Mechanicum news sphere and its server, Hest, had died with Viridian Anchor, and the 900 weapons platforms stood mute against the unfolding atrocity. The ships were so close to the atmosphere as to be visible from the surface, but only momentarily. As one, they opened fire. Shells the size of tanks that had rained on Numinous City plunged planetward, alongside plasma bolts and lance beams. The latter tore into the crust, affecting tectonic destabilization, while the kinetic rounds obliterated buildings, rivers, and mountains. They had no need to target weapon silos or defense batteries. They posed no threat. Infrastructure, the civilian population, the land itself, these were their targets. No region was immune from the attentions of the craft, but some suffered far worse than others. The southern island cities, for example, vanished utterly, consumed by both tectonic instability 
and massive tsunamis that engulfed them. Energy beams targeted the ocean itself, flash vaporizing millions of cubic meters of seawater into a super-dense boiling fog that consumed organic matter in its inferno. The southern cities had little in the way of military significance. They were not muster sites of opportunity. Subsequent analysis, followed by later word-bearer ground attacks on Numinous City and Ithraca, has led to supposition among scholars that such cities and regions were targeted for destruction based on occult significance. Then the manner of their destruction was also imparted with ritualistic meaning. As it stands, this explanation persists through scholarship for anything involved in the Battle of Kalth that cannot be explained by tactical efficacy. The lunacy of the word bearers and the arcane practices they engaged so greedily in are best left ill understood. Such debased acts were played out not only by the bombard vessels, but also by kill team strikes undertaken by word bearer Astartes on select orbital weapon platforms. Though utterly disabled, each platform still bore within them a crew that numbered in the hundreds. Some were blown out of the skies in opportunistic broadsides by passing word-bearer ships, while many others were simply ignored. Yet others still were singled out for boarding actions. Again, the random nature of the attacks can most reliably be chalked up to occult reasoning. The 17th Legion appeared to be seeking out specific targets amongst the platforms. Resistance to the boarding parties was led by Solar Auxilia Tercios, stationed aboard each. These troops, the finest unaugmented soldiery within the system, were equipped per the standard solar pattern. Void sealed hazard armor and highly powered LAS rifles and Vulkite beam weaponry. They had, of course, never been intended to fight against the forces of the Legiones Astartes. Despite formidable training, and years of experience in shipboard Zone Mortalis engagements, resistance was doomed. What casualties the last rifle sections of the Auxilia were able to inflict upon the word bearers was petty recompense for the bolter fire butchery that the 17th meted out upon them. Not only that, but the enemy was unlike anything the Auxilia had previously fought. Not only were they the transhuman ferocity of the Astartes incarnate, but even how they conducted themselves was uncanny by Space Marine standards. Many sang mournful plain song, or chanted hopeless dirges while in combat. Others would ritually disembowel their foes, striding through torrents of las fire just for the opportunity to slowly and painfully strip a service person of their bodily organs even as the soldier begged for their parents. Others still were captured alive, slapped into chains branded with uncomfortable to gaze upon runes, and forced back into the docked boarding ships, never to be seen again. Their fates almost certainly ones filled with blood and horror. There were, against all odds, some loyalist victories, amidst the massacres. On platform Principia Viridia 27-K, the 222nd Kalth Solar Auxilia enacted a neutron radiation cascade of the main hangar bay following the arrival of word-bearer assault craft. So intense was this purge that even Astartes' physiologies would not resist its effects. The 222nd followed the radiation cascade with a bayonet charge their void armor keeping the radiation at bay just long enough to overrun the withering Astartes before perishing themselves. Not a single warrior from either side survived the engagement. In almost all cases, however, the bridge was the target of the word-bearer boarding actions, with as many bridge commanders as possible taken alive and forced to watch the bombardment of Kalth through the viewports for minutes at a time before having their throats slowly slit by the knives of word-bearer Dark Apostles. Once again, the cruelty was the point. 
It has been hypothesized by scholars of the occult that the act of witnessing, the observance of the destruction of what these officers had been meant to protect, was done so to drench the departing soul in as much misery as could be inflicted upon one of their station. Had any the eyes to do so, they would have seen the cruiser Samothrace, now under the command of Sorak Tachur, who had performed the first murder, amongst many, dock at Zetsunverid Yard at Mark 0 0.58.08, .08, the structure significantly spared from destruction. At Mark 01.57.42, nearly two hours after the order to return fire had been given, Rubut Gulliman had come to a conclusion. Vox nets and Auspex grids, not to mention two hours of unremitting slaughter in abject silence from the 17th Legion, had pushed the Primarch's clemency to its limits. A moat of data amongst the torrent that Gilliman had been parsing stood out. Sensor screeds drawn from multiple sources immediately prior to the calamity of Viridian Anchor. Data that pointed to the acceleration of the fleet tender Campanile. Data that, when correlated with system traffic logs, showed her path from the outer void to the inner volumes. Data that, when taken into account, established what Gilliman referred to as a precondition of malice. Not that, he noted two hours after the mark began, that there was any real question any longer. It was merely the shred of evidence his mind required to close the proverbial door. The Primarch rescinded his earlier broadcast and replaced it with the following. Lorgar of Colchis, you may consider the following. 1. I entirely withdraw my previous offer of solemn ceasefire. It is cancelled and it will not be made again. To you or any other of your motherless bastards. 2. You are no longer any brother of mine. I will find you, I will kill you, and I will hurl your toxic corpse into hell's mouth. The McCrag's honor placed that message upon broadcast, as Gilliman hurried to implement a more robust system of intership communication, resorting to direct laser comm systems and card copy orders dispatched by lighters, repair vehicles, or even single-man fighter craft. Anything a ship may have to bring the Primarch's word to another vessel. Gilliman himself resolved to target the Fidelitas Lex, Lorgar's personal Gloriana class flagship. It was, of course, both tactically expedient and personal, with the Primarch openly admitting to Marius Gage that he wanted to be the one to bring death to his erstwhile brother. That this will be the one time he will fight a battle with his hearts not his head. It was at this mark that a lithocast signal from the 17th Primarch was received, requesting an audience with Gilliman. Unable to deny the request, Gilliman raised the Videlitas Lex. What occurred next was, in infamy, recorded for posterity. Have you lost your temper, Rabute? I am going to gut you. You have lost your temper. The great and calm and level-headed Rabute Gellerman has finally succumbed to passion. I will gut you. I will skin you. I will behead you. Ah, Rabute, here at the very end, I finally hear you talk in a way that actually makes me like you. Precondition of malice. You took the Campanile. By my estimation, you took it at least 140 hours ago. You took the ship, and you staged this. You organized this atrocity, Lorgar, and you made it seem like a terrible accident, so you could capitalize on our mercy. You made us stay our hand while you committed murder. It's called treachery, Rabuta. It works very well. How did you find out? We backplotted the Campanile's route once we'd worked out what hit the yards. 
when you look back at the plot, the notion that it was any kind of accident becomes laughable. As is the notion you can hurt me. We're not going to debate it, you maggot, you treacherous bastard. I just wanted you to know that I will rip your living heart out. And I want to know why. Why? Why? If this is our puerile old feud boiled to the surface, then you are the most pathetic soul in the cosmos. Pathetic! Our father should have left you out in the snow at birth. He should have fed you to Russ, you worm, you maggot. This has nothing to do with our enmity, Rabute, except that it affords me the opportunity to venge my honor on you and your ridiculous toy soldiers. That is just a delicious bonus. No, this is the Ushkulthu! Kalth is the Ushkulthu! The offering, it is the sunrise of a new galaxy! A new order! You're rambling, you bastard! The galaxy is changing, Robute! It is turning upside down! Up will be down, and down will be up! Our father will be tossed out of his throne. He will fall down, and no one will put him back together again. Loka, you... Listen to me, Robute. You think you are so clever, so wise, so informed. But this has started already. It is already underway. The galaxy is turning on its head. You will die, and our father will die. And so will all the others, because you are all too stupid to see the truth. Listen to me, Robute. Listen to me. The Imperium is finished. It is falling. It is going to burn. Our father is done. His malicious dreams are over. Horus is rising. Horus? Horus Lubarkal is rising, Robute. You have no idea of his ability. He is above us all. We stand with him or we perish entirely. You shit, Logar. Are you drugged? Are you mad? What kind of insanity Horace. is... Horus! Horus what? He is rising! He is coming! He will kill anyone who stands in his way! He will rule! He will be what the Emperor could never be! Horus would... <clears throat> Horus would never turn. If any of us turned, the others Horus would... Horus has risen against our cruel and abusive parent, Robute. Accept that, and you will die with greater peace in your heart. Horus Lupercal has come to overthrow the imperial corruption and punish the abuser. It is already happening, and Horus is not alone. I am with him, sworn and true. So is Fulgrim, Angron, Perturabo, Magnus, Mortarion, Curs, Alfarius. Your loyalty is air and paper, Rabute. Our loyalty is blood. You're lying. You're dying. Istvan Five burns. Brothers are dead already. Dead? Who are Ferris Manis, Korax, Vulcan? All dead and gone. Slaughtered like pigs. These are all lies. Look at me, Rabute. You know they are not. You know it. You studied every one of us. You know our strengths and our failings. Theoretical, Rabute. Theoretical! You know this is possible. You know from the very facts that this is a possible outcome. Whatever you think of me, Rabute, whatever your opinion, I know it is about as low as it can be. You know I'm not a stupid man. I would betray my brother and attack the assembled might of the Thirteenth Legion for a grudge? Really? Really? Practical, Rabute! I am here to exterminate you and the Ultramarines because you are the only force left in the Emperor's camp that can possibly stop Horus. You are too dangerous to live, and I am here to make sure you do not. I'm here to remove you from the game, Rabute. Either you're insane, or the galaxy has gone mad. Whichever... I am coming for you, and I will put you and your heathen killers down. 
Excommunicate Traitorous. You will not have any opportunity to reflect upon the monstrosity of this crime. Oh, Rabute, I can always rely on you to sound like a giant, pompous asshole. Come and get me. We'll see who burns first. One last thing you need to know, Rabute. You really don't appreciate what you're up against. I've seen enough of his charlatan tricks. Break the Lithocast link. The, the, the link? Sir, the link is already broken? Rabute, let the galaxy burn. From the entirety of the Ultramarines Legion, only five complete chapters were not present at Kalth during the betrayal. Several detachments from other chapters were simply unable to join the conjunction. Elements from the 7th and 22nd chapters, for example, were deemed too embedded in combat against Fra'al Crucible worlds to have their commitment to that purgation withdrawn. Similarly, the 10th chapter was almost as far from Kalth as it was possible to be in galactic terms, committed to compliance operations in the galactic northeast. Nevertheless, as it stood, some 80% of the Ultramarines Legion had been gathered for the muster, and that number was now rapidly diminishing as the atrocities of the word bearers unfolded. In the years to come, those that had been there, or rather those that had survived, formed a sort of in-group within the 13th Legion. Just as how the members of the Shattered Legions, who had somehow emerged from the fires of the Istvan V dropsite massacre, were Astartes apart from what Inductii were raised to their legions hence, and just how, indeed, Great Crusade veterans looked down upon Inductii recruited after the outbreak of the heresy, so too did those that bore the so-called Mark of Kalth, physically and psychologically, come to simply embody a separate group within the Ultramarines. This was, of course, completely unofficial. Gilliman ordered no such division between his warriors, nor even did these warriors petition for one. The rift was unspoken, uh, perhaps the inevitable result of an experience one simply had to have been a part of to fully comprehend. The wound of such base betrayal was a deep one. Marked tendencies towards distrust and paranoia were observed amongst many of Kalt's survivors. Those that were now unmarked, through no fault of their own, were gathered in the majorities of the 7th, 10th, and 19th chapters, as well as the 24th and 25th chapters of Evocatii, stationed as the latter two were around Ultramar for garrison duties and initiate training. None, of course, were untouched by the passage of the Horus Heresy. All paid their dues and conducted themselves with honor and courage. But they were not at Kalth. In the years of the Scouring, this separation would remain unofficial, but become more pronounced. Gilliman was averse to the company of the Unmarked and their council. Unmarked assignments habitually removed them from their brothers by substantial galactic distances. They were the first wave of Astartes to be split from the Legion during the reforms of the Second Founding. They were the first chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, born of Gilliman and the Ultramarines line. The veterans of Kalth, those that had somehow survived the torment of the heresy, were retained within the new Ultramarines chapter. Let the legacy of that day live on, and not merely pass into dusty recorded chronicle. By Mark 02.02.33, the majority of the surviving Ultramarine elements on Kalth existed upon its surface. The Void was ablaze with the wreckage of Viridian Anchor, and uncountable ships of the Legion murdered by still-hunting word-bearer attack craft. 
Even the McCrag's honor, had any beheld her, sported visible damage to her bridge, the result of an arcane attack by Lorgar Aurelian. Gilliman was uncontactable. He had been on the bridge of the flagship when the explosion wrought by his traitor brother's warpcraft had blown out the viewing ports. There was no accurate mark for when the killing on the surface of Kalth began. As one's own record has shown, there exist at timestamps previous moments of significant damage inflicted to the ultramarine muster sites by calamities falling from orbit. But as to when the first bolter was fired by the first word bearer, that is far more unclear. Necrocortical analysis of corpses recovered from the irradiated wastes of Kalth point to instances of attacks occurring before ships like the Destiny's Hand began their orbital murder. In the most isolated of conjunction sites, far from major population centers, it appears small units of ultramarines were set upon by, usually, far greater numbers of word-bearers and their cultic auxilia in acts of homicide as base as they were opportunistic. At the edge of the satric wastes, the corpses of ultramarines and imperialis auxilia alike were transformed into grotesque mockeries of their former forms, arranged in gory tableaus in devotion to the Dark Pantheon. Initially believed by scholars to have been simple outpourings of blood-maddened lunacy on behalf of the 17th Legion, laterally it has been posited that such ritualism in proximity to Erebus's own grand workings deep in the wastes, tied these murders into the eventual ushering in of the Ruin Storm. The attack of the Campanile had, of course, marked the beginning of open slaughter on the surface of Kalth, with the birth of what looked like a new star in the planet's skies. As in orbit, this period is marked by punishing losses, and little in the way of retribution. Assassination cadres of word-bearers, infiltrated into Ultramarine's command positions under the guise of friendship, committed first strikes on 13th Legion leadership, casting the rigid command structure into utter disarray. With the Mechanicum newsphere in utter ruin, rampaging scrap code caused lethal biofeedback to any magus who attempted to access it. The 13th Legion was scattered, rudderless, utterly at the whims of the word-bearers in these first few hours. At the Komesh muster site, the 9th chapter was almost entirely wiped out by the 17th Legion forces under the command of Fodral Fell. Out of 20,000 ultramarines present at the site prior to the attack of the Campanile, barely 5,000 were able to retreat from the slaughter under the command of the Tetrarch of Ultramar, Toro Nicodemus. Further north, the Legio Certivora punished the first, second, and third chapters at the Erod muster, the ultramarines bearing almost nothing in the way of weaponry that could harm god-engine-class machines. It was only by a quirk of timing that the armored company of the first chapter had not completed its embarkation, allowing the 13th to rally several Shadow Sword and Falcon super heavy battle tanks against the attacking Titans. Through ambush operations, the first chapter was able to inflict some measure of recompense against the invaders, grievously wounding several god engines, but such fighting cost them the majority of their number, escaping Erud with only a single badly damaged Falcon and two Shadow Swords under the command of Captain Sidance. On Kalth Nightside, Ultramarines in charge of munition resupply were assaulted by hordes of cultic fanatics. Succeeding in barricading themselves into ammunition manufactoria, the 13th held the rabble of Lorgar at bay until their own firearms began to run dry. Much like in the orbital volume, Tales of loyalist victories amongst the slaughter are few, but there are some. In Thracias, close to the planet's northern polar regions and Erebus's ritual site, the isolated arcologies and research stations of that area 
were preyed upon by large numbers of word-bearer Galvor Back, the demonically possessed shock troops of the 17th Legion. The fate of the innocents amongst the population are unknown, but given the speed at which the so-called Blessed Sons tore through the region, the established fate of captives who fell living into the clutches of the 17th, we can surmise their deaths contributed to the enactment of the ritual, and in many ways that were, quite likely, extremely slow and painful. However, given the Galvorback obsession with the collection of baseline human prisoners, the possessed Astarte somehow neglected to account for the presence of the Ultramarine's 22nd chapter, also mustering in the Polar Climes. Essentially pariahs within their own legion, the 22nd formed the so-called Nemesis chapter, bearers of destroyer-grade weaponry, phosphex, alchem, and radiological rounds. Annihilation-class munitions meant for purgation operations, they were supposed last-resort weapons publicly scorned by Gilliman, but nevertheless stocked by his legion should their use be necessary. As a byproduct of their role, the Nemesis chapter had long since become inured to the foul and the fallen, having fought Xenos abominations galaxy-wide for centuries. Thus, the assumption on their part was that the Galvor back represented some form of hitherto unknown alien corruption, or infection, that had overtaken the word-bearers. Whether simply a part of the 17th or its entirety had succumbed, was not within the minds of the 22nd to discern, merely to act upon. The destroyers of the Ultramarines immediately came to a war footing, and the conflict in the Thracian wilderness rapidly became unto hell itself. The region bathed in crawling phosphex torrents and howling radiological storms. At Mark 04.55.34, the seizure of Zetsun Verid Yard by Sorot Chur and Kor Feron was given great and terrible purpose. At this timestamp, it was recorded that the dock's systems were restored to full operation by Tagmata of the so-called True Mechanicum allied to the word bearers. The data engines, unable to communicate with the Mechanicum server long since perished, scried the new sphere for any authorities greater than themselves. Finding none, standard protocol was engaged and server authority granted to the Zetsun central engine. As part of Mechanicum redundancy initiatives, Zetsun Verid Yard was always to be designed to act as an emergency backup, and now under the stewardship of the word bearers, the planetary weapons grid was slaved to its cogitators. By Mark 05.05.22, the senior Majos in command reported to Corferon that full manifold capabilities had been restored, and that targeting solutions were present for the first captain's approval. Corferon immediately ordered discretionary fire. At Mark 05.05.47, the Kalth Orbital Weapons Array began to kill the Viridian system. The grid had been designed by the Mechanicum, under Gilliman's express orders, to fortify Kalth against a threat equivalent to an Imperial Expeditionary Fleet, and to operate independently of any starship support. The firepower it wielded was simply astonishing. Its first target was an asteroid once named Alamasta, the remnant of a planet that had, eons before, suffered a catastrophic exterplanetary impact. Now reborn as Viridia Forge, it was a massive hub of Mechanicum industry, the most significant manufacturing center in the local galactic volume. It had been helpless since the attack of the Campanile, lacking its shields, and of course, possessing no means of evasion. In four prolonged strikes, Viridia Forge was murdered. The first two strikes incinerated the surface rock layers of the asteroid, piercing the adamantine shell of the inner habitations. 
The third strike popped the main fabricatory hub like a bubble, exposing thousands of square kilometers internally to hard vacuum. The fourth strike ruptured its internal reactors and created a new star in the ensuing nuclear explosion. The death of Viridia Forge, aligned as it was, caused Kalth to have no night side for the next 18 minutes. At Mark 06.59.59, Chapter Master Marius Gage regained consciousness in the upper reaches of the McCrag's Honor Conning Tower, or rather, what was left of it. Lorgar's final transmission had ended in what was one of the first historical examples of an aggressive incarnation of a lesser demonic emanation to be successfully deployed against Loyalist forces. The sheer force of its impact and subsequent detonation had blown out the main viewing ports of the flagship strategium, venting the space to the icy grip of the void. Gilliman had been claimed by the howling winds of explosive decompression before the blast shutters had been able to activate. The Primarch's whereabouts, or even whether he was alive or not, were utterly unknown. Over a dozen senior Legion officers and support staff had died in the process. The shipmaster had been eviscerated by a hail of shattered glass. Chapter Master Varad had bodily thrown himself into space in an attempt to rescue his Primarch. He was never to be seen again. Gage himself had only survived by bodily hauling himself through the emergency hatches prior to closure doing so on one arm, the demon thing having claimed one of his limbs. The flagship was in utter disarray. The lithic avatar of Lorgar's transformation was not the only manifestation aboard. The entire Gloriana-class battleship was now a playground for the Neverborn. Demon things of material shadow cavorted and slaughtered their way through her entire superstructure, dancing between dimensions as a terrified mortal crew attempted to fight or flee equally in vain. A few of the more veteran Legiones Astartes personnel were privy to, on the most basic level, the existence of the violent predators of the Immaterium, assuming them, as even some of the most learned of the Imperium had, to be an unknown extra-dimensional breed of alien. These veterans were also aware of the effects of localized warp breaches and the mass psychosis and realitic disruptions that they could cause. However, the flagship was not in the warp. It was firmly in real space, and the Ultramarines aboard had been plunged into combat with an enemy unlike anything they had ever fought. Any hope of a coordinated defense simply never existed. The very minds of the human crew broke at the mere sight of even the most lesser of emanations, if even they had managed to survive the encounters with incarnated clouds of malice and knives. Gibbering corpse things of swollen, rotted flesh capered chaotically, while burning demonia whose skins flowed like lava split crewmen in half with swords as tall as they were. Yet others split and fused and split again, belching multicolored fire through too many eyes, while lithe things in mockeries of human form slowly peeled the skin off howling mortals with chitinous claws. The McCrag's honor became a scene unto some ancient grimoire, a lurid tapestry of travesties drawn from the most polluted of minds. Marius Gage, Recovering from the envenomed wound that was forcing even his Astartes physiology to struggle, attempted to place what order he could upon the situation, ordering ultramarines to link up with their brothers wherever possible and for human crew members to barricade themselves in place. Even this proved nigh impossible. The mangled intraship Vox was subject not only to blackouts, but warp corruption and time dilation. Witnesses spoke of receiving the chapter master's orders hours after he issued them, alongside other localized phenomena, 
angles of bulkheads stretching beyond the possible, corridors reaching into infinity. Ragtag squads of Legionnaires Astartes, naval armsmen, and desperate crew formed by circumstance, haphazardly but nevertheless admirably responding to the invasion with standardized and well-drilled Legion counter-boarding protocols. In all cases, however, these measures had been designed to fight the enemies the Imperium had waged war against for 200 years. They were never meant to account for the Neverborn. Evacuated and sealed off sections of the ship were subject to rad purges, toxic gas deluges, hard decompression or temperature cascades, and simply nothing worked. The demonic were impervious to things meant to combat mortals or even Xenos bodies. The dire state of the communications grid and the loss of so many Legion officers meant that such discoveries could not be efficiently transmitted to other Legion elements, forcing mistakes to be committed again and again and again to dire results. The famed abilities of ultramarine analysis, their dedication to theoretical and practical was sundered, through no fault of their own, by attacks from beings utterly unbeholden to the rules of fundamental reality. Despite horrific losses, these hours of combat aboard the McCrag's honor gave way to pockets of concentrated resistance, stoic defense cordons centered around specific warriors and groups of warriors, who, by dint of circumstance or skill, were able to navigate the increasingly desperate situation. Captain Hutonicus of the Ultramarine's 161st Company had taken command of a group of Astartes initiates, only recently raised to full legionary status. With next to nothing in the way of actual combat experience, it fell to Hutonicus to rally and lead them amongst a foe unlike anything the Imperium, let alone he, had the ability to coordinate a fight against. That a mere quarter of the initiates under the captain's charge survives is less a tragedy and more a miracle. Those that did, bloodied in extremis against otherworldly foes, almost universally went on to become warriors of profound renown in the lives they would lead thereafter. Chapter Master Empion of the Ninth Chapter had survived the initial wave of incursions while inspecting a large contingent of his subordinates, and was thus perhaps best placed to lead any resistance. Coalating defense around Deck 35, Empion was able to gather to his command yet more Astartes, as well as Solar Auxilia, Exertus Imperialis, and Navis Imperialis troops that had managed to survive. A robust fighting force at his disposal, Empion became one of the few Legion elements aboard to mount a determined advance through the McCrag's honor in an effort to establish connections with the rest of the Legion. By far the most famous combatant of this particular phase of the atrocity was, however, an individual, Sergeant Aeonid Thiel of the 135th Company. Thiel's presence aboard the flagship has entered record as one of history's greatest ironies. The sergeant had been marked for formal censure, to be delivered by the Primarch himself, for the outrageous breach of standards of applying the concepts of theoretical and practical thought exercises towards the combating of fellow space marines. When the incursions began, Thiel had been awaiting Gilliman's rebuke in the Primarch's private quarters, and had been forced to defend himself with the first weapons he was able to lay hands upon. Display pieces retained by Gilliman, an electromagnetic longsword, and a Kelatai friction axe. Both armaments were incredibly rare, relic weapons kept as historical artifacts from long exterminated species as a testament to the skill and creativeness of their long past weaponsmiths. Fighting his way through the demon things that beset him to recover his personal firearms, Thiel quite immediately noticed that the axe and sword were significantly more effective in combating the Neverborn than his bolt pistol was, despite the gun being, ostensibly, a far more potent deterrent on paper. He has been credited, 
at least in heresy-era hagiography, as being one of the first Astartes of the Legions to happen upon the revelation that the demonic require combating within the realm of the conceptual as much as the physical. That to the emanations of the warp, the simple savagery of flame and sword bears a narrative heft lacking in the technology developed over millennia, an element of story that is profoundly lethal to them. Eunid Thiel, an oddity amongst his legion for his unique approaches to the practical, reasoned that the looting of the Primarch's personal weapons archive was a perfectly sound option amongst his circumstances. Soon, the sergeant was leading a band of fellow Astartes alongside Solar Auxilia and even several abhuman bondsmen, all armed with relic weapons of absolutely priceless rarity. His advance permitted him to link up with Chapter Master Empion and Captain Hutonicus, the combined force pushing now to the remains of the bridge, where they encountered First Chapter Master Gage. In an act of admirable humility for one of his station, Gage recognized that out of all three leaders, Thiel's methods had achieved the most success, and that his information and experience should be as rapidly disseminated amongst the Legion as possible. Against these inexplicable invaders, melee weaponry should be utilized. The first chapter master withheld judgments on Thiel's more apparently fanciful summations, that the demons, as he referred to them, were susceptible to arcane and ancient human practices specifically. Nevertheless, Gage appointed the sergeant as overall tactical authority in the field, superseding even Empion and Hoytonicus by dint of merit and ability. Thiel's task initially was to recover the shipmaster Hamed of the craft Sanctity of Saramanth, whose salvation pods had been recovered by the flagship immediately prior to the loss of her bridge. While this was ongoing, Chapter Master Empion led a strike upon the Sharship's auxiliary bridge. With the knowledge and skill of the shipmaster, as well as control over a command center, the wounded Marius Gage hoped to wrest some measure control over the situation. At Mark 11.40.02, Marius Gage's forces had claimed control over the auxiliary bridge of the McCrag's honor. The efforts expended to do so had cost many ultramarine lives, but had saved the fate of Shipmaster Hamed from certain death and rescued senior members of the Mechanicum from the besieged Forge Fane at the vessel's heart. A full systems purge was completed within minutes, and for the first time in nearly twelve hours, senior Legion leadership was able to raise Voxlinks with ultramarines on Kalth's surface. The situation, unfolding through rebooted sensorium suites, was beyond catastrophic. While upon the surface, remnants of the Legion could be established as continuing to mount resistance, within the orbital volume, barely a fifth of the 13th ships could be considered battle-worthy. Worse yet, the Auspex sweeps picked up several word-bearer cruisers in close formation with the flagship telltale signs of external boarding operations being launched. While the 17th Legion had not launched torpedoes, the Ultramarines surmised that even now their Astartes would be attempting to gain ingress through airlocks, clearly in an attempt to capture the flagship as a prize with as little damage as possible. Chapter Master Empion was assigned the task of leading a counter-boarding assault, to draw upon every Ultramarine's legionary the command staff could muster at this point in the battle for the flagship. Forty distinct groups, each numbering up to thirty Astartes, exited the airlocks of the McCrag's honor, entering the cold embrace of the void as they made their way towards carefully designated targets of priority. The foe's docking towers, extended from line cruisers, were primary amongst these. Astartes were additionally assigned to detaching void grapples, sabotaging the enemy's fusion drill heads, and to simply killing as many word-bearers, infesting the ship's hull as possible. 
wearing void harnesses to speed their passage through the paper-thin atmospheric shell around the Honor's superstructure. Legionaries advanced rapidly across the hull, navigating through a cyclopean, city-scaled landscape of brutal ceramite constructions, unfit for the passage of any. Yet, now, the battlefield upon which the fate of all aboard would be decided. It was not long before the word-bearers were encountered. An Astartes moves with inhuman speed under normal circumstances, and in the almost gravityless environments, their speed was truly astonishing. All pretense of stealth was disposed of out of hand. The possibility that such an environment, even providing for it, was discounted by Gage and Empion far in advance of the actual engagements. The slate grey hull did nothing to hide the brilliant blue of ultramarine power armor. Their approach was quickly spotted by word-bearer boarders, and soon bolter rounds sped through the void, rupturing armor and transhuman bodies in perfect, horrid silence. The power of space marine physiology was on full display in this unique environment. Bolt rounds, which cracked Astarte's battle plate, caused partial armor decompression before the automated inner system seals worked to contain pressure loss. Even Astartes, whose limbs had been exposed to the cutting nothingness of hard space, could retain their use, maimed as they were, dependent only on rapidly diminishing oxygen reserves. Melees sent victims tumbling away into the vacuum, trailing chains of beaded, frozen blood like tiny asteroids. It was as brutal as any fight had ever been that dreadful day, yet all the more horrific for the total silence in which it unfolded. At Mark 12.42.16, the tide of one such engagement had turned upon the strike force led by Aeonid Thiel. A counterattack down the docking tower by the 17th Legion had been committed in far greater numbers than the Ultramarines had anticipated, and had come from an entirely different axis in the three-dimensional nature of space battles, too merely add to the punishment. As the Ultramarines clung to whatever cover they could upon the hull, bolter fire rained at them both along the superstructure and from above it. Such was the nature of the desperate attack in the first place, that Thiel and his Astartes reckoned with their destinies that they must sell their lives as dearly as possible in the face of overwhelming odds. Yet, an entirely new miracle made itself manifest at this mark, one free of the dark blasphemies of word-bearer warpcraft. Rubut Gulliman plunged out of the void like a comet in cobalt, an inaudible howl of rage painted across his astonishingly helmless face. Bereft of full atmospheric armor, the Primarch's physiology had somehow allowed him to survive in the trace atmosphere that persisted around the Macrag's honor's massive form. For ten hours, the Primarch had fought and survived without any air supply, exposed to near absolute zero of hard vacuum, a feat of survival that, to be perfectly frank, is without all precedent in records of and research into the mysteries of Primarch genetic biology. It is, of course, accepted that the body of a Primarch was able to withstand the effects of hypocapnia, ebulism, extremes of temperature, even pressure-driven body mass expansion, for potentially extended periods. That a Primarch's body could continue to function without oxygen for such a span of time is utterly beyond the comprehension of even the most learned of gene rites. It can only stand as a testament to the dreadful genius of the Emperor and the constitution and sheer overwhelming will of Gilliman himself. The Lord of Macrag hit the word-bearers with the force of a juggernaut, demolishing them in an outburst of pure fury, the likes of which none of the surviving Ultramarines had likely even believed their Primarch to be capable of. Their mission accomplished. It fell to Thiel and his men to convince Gilliman to return with them to the captured strategium. His prowess in combat had saved them, but his mind and genius were now desperately needed in the greater battle yet to be waged. 
There is next to no disputing of the overwhelming tactical advantage possessed by the word bearers during the first 24 hours of the Battle of Kalth. They had complete control of the orbital volume thanks to the Campanile strike, the subsequent surprise attacks by their fleet, and their possession of the orbital weapons grid. On the planet's surface, Wordbearer ground forces immediately gained possession of every single significant tactical objective, and had inflicted such devastating casualties and infrastructural damage as to deny the Ultramarines any opportunity to organize cohesively, let alone mount a counterattack. The 13th Legion's resistance was, at best in the early hours, able to form in isolated, harried pockets around survivors bereft of any other options. It is notable, then, that as the hours of slaughter and massacre ground on, the word-bearers appeared for everything to squander the position of superiority they held, abandoning fundamental military strategy in favor of genocidal actions. Seemingly without recourse for strategy or objectives, the 17th Legion and their cultic auxiliaries, in almost all Grand Warfare theaters, descended into a sort of butcher lunacy, seeking for all the world to merely kill and destroy and kill and destroy. It is a testament to the sheer advantage the traitors held and the utter surprise of their betrayal that even with these bizarre and flawed tactics, they were still able to inflict staggering numbers of casualties upon the Ultramarines, their attached auxilia, the Mechanicum, and Kalt's civilian population. It is likewise a testament to the training and character of the 13th Legion that, in almost all documented cases, isolated detachments of Ultramarines under attack put aside the pain of their foe's perfidy in favor of devising methods of defense and survival with whatever tools they had at their immediate disposal, resolving to inflict as much pain upon the hated foe as transhumanly possible. Two tetrarchs of Ultramar, iconic senior officers of the Legion, formed loci of resistance during the early hours of the betrayal. At the Holofusicon, a museum dedicated to imperial culture and civilization, Icos Lamiat, the Iron Warden of Konor, had drawn to his banner regiments of the Imperial Army and scattered bands of Ultramarines' heavy armor, supplementing his retinue of Solar Auxilia from the 41st Espandor, as well as a Soul Contemptor Pattern Dreadnought and a single Thanatar Siege Automata from the Legio Cybernetica. Lamiad's band forged a path through the scrub deserts surrounding the Holofusicon, organizing survivors into columns heading towards Lanshir. The second tetrarch, Toro Nicodemus, led the remains of the Ultramarines' ninth chapter against the 17th Legion forces commanded by Fodral Fell. The word-bearers had fragmented, under orders from Fell, to annihilate Erud province, allowing tetrarch Nicodemus to surgically strike the most isolated and apparently blood-mad units, while avoiding larger forces, all the while following an isolated but powerful Vox transmission emanating from a fortified manor belonging to the planetary governor at Leptius Numinius. Far to the south, in the burning forests of Sharud province, the remains of the 11th and 12th chapters of the Ultramarines mounted an extraordinarily coordinated defense against traitor Mechanicum Automata and word-bearer support units. Fire teams defended roughly established dugouts of earthen defenses and felled trees, the secondary teams to the rear hurriedly preparing new improvised fortifications, in a display of ad hoc coordination likely unmanageable by all but a few legions. As fighting ground on, as more and more word-bearer momentum bled away as the Legion indulged in seemingly pointless slaughter or bizarre, grotesque rituals, Ultramarine survivors were granted some measure of respite, however brief. It has been noted by certain scholars that, 
had these been Astartes of legions shattered at Istvan, this relative lull would have been caused to regroup and strike at the nearest available enemy formation. In an attempt to sell their lives as dearly as possible in a forlorn, last-ditch attempt at vengeance. But the Loyalist muster ongoing at Lanshire, including a miraculously unscathed Titan maniple from the Legio Oberon, they were seemingly assembling a force that would have been capable of such a bloodthirsty advance. Whatever your scholastic or personal opinion of Gilliman's sons, it is notable that no such strike was attempted, not even necessarily contemplated. Records show that what senior officials were present in the outskirts of Lanshire all agreed that linking up with fellow loyalists, collating combat forces, logistical support, and experiences was paramount above all else to their survival, even over the reaping of vengeance. This example is admittedly one amongst what was, generally speaking, wholesale slaughter. The Loyalists were losing, by any measurable means, as minutes turned into hours. Innumerable murders, both vast in scale and intimate in their atrocity, played out across the entire globe. Neverborn incursions were summoned by word-bearer esoterists and dark apostles across Sanachi province and the southern continent. Lesser emanations beset fleeing civilian columns in orgies of senseless bloodshed beyond human description. On the fields of Komesh, 20,000 ultramarines lay dead or mortally wounded, the latter being recovered by word-bearer Astartes to be nailed bodily to the hulls of their tanks, oozing blood daubed in putrid sigils on their shattered blue armor plate. Corfeiron, in orbit, ordered the destruction of the Corvel Islands by nuclear fire, seemingly without any reason, beyond the fact that the path of his starship brought them within range of a firing solution. A Legio Cybernetica division at Silantor, ammunition long since expended, fought back hordes of ragged cultists with piston-driven arms, the Magi in charge desperately devoted percentages of their enhanced brain power to restoring some measure of a communications grid. In the Manufactoria at Danehold, less than a thousand ultramarines of the 15th and 8th chapters were besieged by word-bearers of the Flayed Hand, resisting their advances for nearly twelve hours of constant combat before succumbing to an assault by two hundred cataphractii armored Terminator Astartes. From all of this, in the grand historiography of the Calth atrocity, the Battle of Ithrica tends to emerge as a point of focus for many scholars, notable not only for its sheer apocalyptic scale, even by the standards of the atrocity, but for how much it presaged the conflicts that were yet to come in the Age of Darkness. It stands as an example of the sheer ferocity of war between betrayer and betrayed, for the malevolent forces unleashed by its unfolding, and for the sheer implausible carnage. Ultimately, as well, it noted that the war would not be one merely fought by Astartes legions, nor would they be the only ones to suffer. Other august and ancient bodies of the Imperium and humanity would surely fall alongside both. The city of Ithraca, was the most important orbital transfer hub on Calth, with only the docks of Lanshire rivaling it in terms of sheer tonnage moved every single day. Several thousand square kilometers of landing zones, warehouses, and transfer infrastructure formed an uneven triangle across the region, with the city growing around and below it, linking to significant subterranean arcology developments. At first, thousands then millions of residents called Ithrica home, and with them came webs of arterial roadways, networks of maglev train lines. In typical Ultramarian fashion, the city appeared organic, but its development was highly planned, easily housing its population, all the while preparing for millions more to come. At its center, the Heliocon, 
served as primary orbital traffic control for Calt's southern reaches, and the Ithrica docks in particular, while also standing prepared to serve as a backup hub for the orbital defense grid. To the north of the metropolis lay the sea, and the coastline that was dominated by a gigantic industrial aqueduct linking to three massive water reservoirs and desalinization plants, intended to provide the city with both drinking water and coolant for its many manufactoria. When the Kalth Conjunction had been called, Ithraca transformed into its war footing. The formidable logistical capacities of the city, given over to ammunition storage and transfer, the scale of its macro facilities, allowing it to permit the landing of the largest of orbital dropships. Naturally, thanks to the latter in particular, this made its hinterlands the ideal location for the muster of the Titan legions attached to the Astartes forces assembling. Two legions gathered in their near entirety, the Legio Presagius, the true messengers, and the Legio Surter Vora, the fire masters, combining some 200 god engines in total, a force sufficient to raise an entire subsector to ash. Locals likened it to the city suddenly developing a second skyline, with the Titans lined up in ordered ranks in the scrublands beyond the metropolis's boundaries, their war horns carrying even over the thunder of orbital launches. It was not just the titans of the Collegia that the city's capacity had room for. It had also been marked as the host for the Exertus Imperialis's heaviest tank divisions, for both repair and rearmament. The largest amongst these was the Kalak War Host, formed of regiments drawn from the industrialized, tidally locked night worlds of the Kalak sequence. The host alone numbered some 90,000 strong, all entirely mechanized infantry and armored divisions, as well as five artillery companies and two cohorts of super-heavy tanks. The fourth chapter of the Ultramarines, the Aurorans, armored warfare specialists themselves, were hosted alongside their machines in the city's subterranean core, as well as the 24th chapter, the Exitium. This latter formation formed the Legion's strategic reserve, less a frontline chapter, and more a dedicated, above-strength contingent bearing an abundance of support weaponry, mobile artillery, and ammunition reserves, all designed to be seconded to any chapter should said chapter suffer egregious losses in any area that would diminish their combat efficacy. Supplementing this was a further 250,000 Exertus troops, everything from feral tribal levies brought by the word-bearers to the Solar Auxilia regiments of Ultramar, as well as automata and magi from the Tagmata Xerxes of the Forge World Akatran. The Ithrica muster was being conducted to the highest of Ultramarine's logistical and efficiency standards, which is to say some of the highest standards in the entire Imperium. Despite this, it was noted in the recovered, if of course damaged, records of the city that there had been a notable spike in unexplained and uncanny phenomena in the weeks prior to the atrocity itself. In particular, those collected from an Arbitrator Notary's Personal Logos Corps, found in the records of Arcology Epsilon 14, align perfectly with the arrival of the Kalak War Host in the region, five weeks local standard prior to the Campanile's murder of Kalth Viridian Anchor. Power outages, localized freak weather patterns, and a 300% increase in equipment failures range amongst these reports. Aligning them with files recovered from municipal Arbita's precincts, scholars have traced a significant upsurge in civil unrest, domestic violence, and mental health breakdowns, leading to, in the immediate days prior to the Calth atrocity, to a spike in murders of a most extremely brutal nature. Alongside this, missing person reports skyrocketed, both in the civilian population and Exertus Imperialis regiments stationed across the city. The wave of incidents culminated in the day before the eventual attack, 
when a fully loaded passenger maglev train, arriving at its terminal station, did so entirely empty, save for blood and viscera coating every interior surface in staggering quantities. This latter event was so extreme as to require escalation far above municipal authorities, calling as they did for the eyes of the Ultramarian regime's secret police, the Vigil Operati. A report filed alongside the request curiously and specifically states that these incidents should not be attributed to the Kallak war host. The host's insularity and apparent barbarism, as well as lack of cooperation with local authorities, had marked them for many as deeply suspicious. Citing, however, Ultramar's creed of tolerance for the lesser cultures of the Imperium, the author commented that it was not uncommon for armed forces drawn from worlds, grown savage during the Age of Strife, to be treated poorly abroad across the Imperium, and that the Kallax technology was clear proof that, for all their moral and social regression, they were a proud people, and that the word-bearers had readily and easily brought them to compliance not two decades before. Only in the wisdom of hindsight are the author's defenses laid bare for what they are. When the fleet tender Campanile struck Calt Veridian anchor, the disaster was not immediately made apparent to the residents of Ithraca. Located as it was in the southern hemisphere, Calt's own mass concealed the light of the orbital detonation. Local dinoral, it was mid-morning, meaning the port was in full logistical productivity. The legios Certervora and Presagius, in conjunction with the rigorous timelines of the muster, had finally moved to embarkation. Massive orbital bulk haulers were being deployed to ferry the god machines to mass conveyor barks in the void above. Given their prestige within the realm of Ultramar, the true messengers had been granted the honor of first embarking. The bulk of its battle group, some seventy titans in number, were arrayed in close marching order at the primary macro-alpha landing zone, with sub-deployments, seconded as they were to other orbital ships, spread across relatively smaller but still vast landing pads of macro-beta at the Alpha's edges. The most venerable, and thus heaviest and most valuable, of Presagius's engines had already been ensconced within the Cyclopean holds of the Arutan, a purpose-built Mechanicum Titan conveyor two kilometers in length and a kilometer across. Such was the sheer mass that the very passage of this craft caused atmospheric disturbances to local weather conditions for days following its passage. So powerful were its plasma lift engines that dedicated air traffic lanes had been rigorously enforced around it, effectively grounding all ships within a large radius of the landing zones for the time being. The vessel had only just cycled its titanic engines to full power, its impossible bulk only beginning to rise from Kalt's service, when the constant new spheric data deluge, the coordinating logistical lifeblood of the world, died in an instant, the victim of the Campanile's attack on Viridian Anchor on the planet's far side. The Arutan continued to rise above Ithraca, as those magi not killed by neurosystemic feedback that was caused by the initial failure cascade, tried desperately and ineffectively to reignite the manifold, establish connection with the planetary newsphere, or even affect improvement of local Vox networks. In place of the moments of dreadful, total silence that followed the initial break, a rising tide of incomprehensible audio and neural signals was now present, the bow wave of a scrap code infestation now claiming ruinous ownership of Kalt's data grid. Every networked cogitator, every networked magus, was now assailed by the pernicious code as it rampaged across the realm of information, killing and destroying with utter abandon. To those traitors present, the silence and the subsequent howling from the grid neither affected nor surprised them. 
It was not a death shriek of technological systems. It was a holy call to arms, the signal they had been waiting for to strike. Sertavora, as one, rose to almost full engine bloom, reactors powering to maximum as hard and as fast as even the feckless engine seers of the so-called true mechanicum could risk. On encrypted, still operational Vox networks, Legio Princeps barked orders in the harsh Martian dialect born of their home within the Mons Sertura. As the engines of the Firemasters began to move, as the first firing solutions were tracked, destruction began to fall from orbit. The first strikes by the orbiting word bearers' fleet had been pre targeted, carefully planned to arrive within seconds of the attack on Viridian Anchor. It is testament to the 17th's knowledge of the sheer martial power gathered at Ithrica that this took priority even over engaging crippled void ships in their proximity. Lance beams, supplemented by plasma burst cutter barrages, struck landing zone Macro Alpha as the princeps of Presagius, deaf and blind within their data-deprived engines, were furiously attempting to establish simply what had happened. They were, of course, utterly helpless, and the destruction was only beginning. The Arutan and its embarkation schedule had been widely known ahead of the attack. The logistics of the matter were common knowledge on channels for both Legioness Astartes involved in the conjunction. The fact that her departure was seemingly timed with the Campanile's attack run was likely to have been, at best, coincidence, but one that served the traitor's purposes extraordinarily well. The lance beams attacking Ithrica from orbit bit deep into her hull. Designed to deliver the god engines of the Titanica to active war zones, the armor of the bulk conveyor was no paltry thing. She was more akin to a battleship in robustness than a mere freighter. What she lacked, of course, was active void shields. There was no need for them in peacetime. The power requirements could be much more readily used in simple engine management. Her upper hull took the full brunt of several battleships worth of broadsides. Even armor of this quality could only survive for so long. The plating heating red and beginning to become molten, the Arutan wavered in its ascent slipping slowly, terribly, sideways in the air, until one of the four plasma engines took the full brunt of a multi-lance strike, breaking from the hull and plunging in fiery death planet-side. The Arutan, slowly, terribly, began to fall. Three remaining engines still burning, this was not a simple direct downward plunge. The Mechanicum conveyor slid across the skyline of the city, the Navarcos aboard desperately attempting to maintain lift to no avail. Her passage began to tear the tops off the tallest buildings, obliterating towers, hab blocks, and thermal exhausts by her passage, before it came to a meteoric landing in the civic parklands in the city core. The Legio Presagius, though horrifically mauled, were far from the only victims of the punitive orbital strike. Whole squadrons of fighter craft had been obliterated, alongside orbital lifters, gunships, and shuttles, idle in Ithrica's many landing zones, as lance beams tore through munition dumps, runways, and fuel reserves. Further horror was unfolding outside the city's boundaries, in the massive barrack zones of the Exertus Imperialis. Billeted together in attempts to improve inter-regimental coordination, Loyalist forces were now set upon by traitors in the most mundane of spaces. Commissaries, recreational halls, training fields, supply depots, their own beds. Across the barrack blocks, soldiers were gunned down at point-blank range in utter surprise. Parade formations were set upon by armored vehicles, grinding stunned loyalists to pulp underneath thundering treads. Blades plunged into sleeping off-shift troopers. It was murder, venal and base, played out now here as it was across the entire planet. 
Fifteen minutes into the massacre, and a deep, thunderous sound was reported to have echoed across the city of Ithraca. Powerful enough even to drown out the howling of disaster sirens and the ongoing tumult of weapons fire and explosions. Given cross comparators with the mark of Kalth per ultramarine records, and taking into account distance, this can be surmised to have been the impact of the grand cruiser Androdamicus in the city of Calcas Fortalis, to that metropolis's utter devastation. The death of the cruiser was immediately answered across the burning swathe of Ithraca by another howl altogether more malevolent. The hundred or so titans of the Legio Surter Vora sounding their war horns in bloody exultation. A legion bellowing for the kill as one. To the titans of Presagius, isolated from the unfolding battle on the fields of Macro Alpha, it was one more mystery atop the torrent they had been subjected to. Their engines had been rendered almost helpless by the loss of the new spheric links. Those that had managed to fire their reactors, light their voids, and restore some measure of auspex had done so only to see the lords of their legion plummeting to apparent destruction as the Arutan fell from the skies. The true messengers were aware that they were likely under attack, but were bereft of information as to how or where from. The actual fighting at this point in the atrocity was primarily restricted to the Imperial Army Zones. The forces of Presagius and the Mechanicum Tagmata Xerxes were far too isolated to know how to react, and still under the presumption that this was either a dreadful accident at best or a Xenos incursion at worst. It was, to their credit, an exemplary reaction by Imperial standards. Fire was withheld, the destructive power of the Titans known all too well to their princeps, the knowledge that, were they to open such fire, they would be doing so at the center of millions of civilians, and this only strengthened their resolve to navigate some means out of the catastrophe. The true danger, of course, would come far too late for the true messengers to properly react. To the southwestern flank of the city, seismic alarms were sounding, detecting an entirely different set of activity, distinct from the aftershocks, rippling through Kalth's crust from the impact of the Androdamicus. From out of the great span of the spur wastes, a barren scrubland that separated landing zones Macro Alpha and Beta, drawn out in a curved battle line seven kilometers in length, came over one hundred titans, charging, running at full stride like a line of ancient clansmen. They were Surtur Vora all, the near full might of that fallen legio baying for war. Anything in their path, and there was plenty in their path, was simply pulverized. Barracks, bivouacs, armor pools, supply depots, friend and foe both, all were dashed to rubble or bloody gore by the passage of Surtavora, flattened by the pounding of the god engine strides. The sheer speed of their advance was nigh unmatched in the annals of the Collegia Titanica. Only the imperial hunters of the Legio Solaria had ever been recorded for having been able to move titans over such distances, at such speed, in such coordination. But historitors have been quick to point out that only the overwhelming element of surprise and utter disregard for collateral damage allowed the Firemasters to accomplish this. Similarly, they note that weapons fire was held until what was, for Titan-class engines, point-blank range. This is certainly verifiable, and ensured the targets of Surtavora were kept in a state of unawareness until the last possible moment. Presagius, attempting to regroup across the spans of Macro Alpha and Macro Beta, were unable to detect their foes until it was far too late. Rounding a line of bombardment shattered and blazing refineries at the boundaries of the landing zones, the power that had been diverted to the Titan's motivators were shunted to weapon systems even before the Legio had brought up its voids. Turning from full charge to maximal fire mode as quickly as their systems could manage, Surtavora prepared to open fire. 
As this was unfolding, above the city, blooms of light, pulsing instances of half-suns birthing and dying, indicated a fight in orbit to anyone who had cast their gaze skywards. Slowly, at first, but increasing in quantity and lethality, debris began to fall on Ithraca, the fragment corpses of ships caught in the gravity well of Kalth. The indiscriminate impacts added exponentially to the chaos unfolding in the city, as civilian infrastructure was overwhelmed both by disaster relief efforts and simple crowd control, terrified workers fleeing for their lives in every direction. One such fiery orb plummeted skywards, somehow managed, had any observed, to arrest its fall, coming instead to a just visible stationary position within the atmosphere far above the metropolis. The inferno was, thanks to recovered sensorium logs, the sign of the orbital re-entry of the Mechanicum Tritonos class Gallias, Dirac's Lament. The vessel was both principal conveyor and sovereign domain of a covenant of the Ordo Reductor known as Mormoth Null, beholden to no one forge in particular, but serving as mendicant destroyers for whatever Tagmata elected to contract their services. Obtaining position in precise geosynchronous orbit above Ithraca, the Gallias fired every single one of its missile batteries simultaneously. Rather than the, one supposes comparatively merciful, atomic bombardments of some cities across Kalth, this was altogether more slower a death. The warheads contained within the missiles fired were directed melter charges, precision instruments of destruction. A great many of them targeted the Ithraca Heliocon, the command and control hub of the city's Mechanicum, wherein even now frantic clades of Lex Mechanics were attempting to reignite the manifold and regain some level of control over the rampaging scrap code. Other missiles streaked towards less primary, but nevertheless valuable targets surviving generator hubs, medical facilities, Arbitez precincts, all targets designed to inflict the most amount of damage to infrastructure that was possible. Precisely 50 meters above these targets, the missiles detonated, their systems channeling their power in exact downward-facing cones of annihilation. Heat and radiation equal in brightness and lethality to a late-stage star obliterated all before them. Adamantium was liquidized. Ferrocrete was turned to black dust. The Heliocon, bearing the brunt of the bombardment, simply ceased to be. The fusion energy unleashed by the Ordo Reductor, marking its presence in a vast, unspeakable mushroom cloud rising skywards. The pressure wave of superheated air incinerated tens of thousands of civilians, in an expanding circle, flash burnt to their ashes, the howling winds demolishing train lines and scattering ground autos like children's toys. On the landing zones, the titans of Presagius angled their voids and shifted their frontage to face this onrushing danger, to best protect those engines only for at this moment, the engines of Sertivora, to strike at this instant at their most vulnerable flanks. The attack of Sertervora was savage beyond anything Presagius had ever experienced. Despite their bravery upon the fields of the Crusade against a gargantuan Xenos horrors, not even the viciousness of the hated Fra'al could match the gluttonous murder-lust the Firemasters displayed in their shock assault. A score of true messenger god engines fell to the first devastating volley, their exposed superstructures bared to the onrushing Sertervora Legio, sundered by searing melta barrages. Torrents of megabolter fire and pinpoint volcano cannon strikes. Reactor casings were torn open, the caged sons of the Titan hearts going critical in a picosecond birthing fusion reactions of unholy lethality right in the middle of their mustard lines. 
Smaller engines caught in these blast waves reeled, or were fully toppled, even as they hurried to adjust their facings against the storm assault. The slaughter was literally unprecedented. Never in the history of the Imperium had so many Titan-class machines been destroyed in so quickly a time, and yet still Sir Hervora advanced. Murder burning in hearts as fiercely as the fire emblems of their panoply, war horns blaring their triumph to the falling skies. On the far side of the city, further slaughter unfolded, on a smaller scale, but no less savage and hideous for it. The Kallak war host breached the cordons of macro landing zone Gamma, Having already killed every Exertus Imperialis trooper, not allied to their secret cause present in their barracks, the host now fell upon the civilian population with unrestrained ferocity, murdering with complete abandon. Into fleeing crowds did they send their tanks, the bladed dozer plates at their fore crushing panicking civilians into wretched pulp. They tore open disaster shelters, laying into the huddled, terrified masses within with bayonet and combat knife, daubing the walls and their armored transports, even themselves, with the blood of their victims in acts of profane lunacy. Any resistance met, be it hastily assembled auxilia defensive positions, or even a canny tech priest coven having locked down their manufactoria, the Kallak war host directed overwhelming armor or air support to crush their enemies. A wave of super-heavy tanks or a mass flight of lightning and avenger strike flyers, obliterating whatever in their path with saturated fire. Despite these clearly coherent responses to mounted enemy defenses, it was clear from reports recovered that the Kallak objective seemed to be, simply, genocidal slaughter. Their pursuit of the helpless citizenry of Ithraca was simultaneously clinical and lunatic. They seized no ground, nor held any. Their divisions that rampaged through the metropolis followed auspex screeds detecting mass human life sign readings. Their malignant hunger for bloodshed appeared insatiable. As the Kallak spread ever outwards, new, fiery contrails appeared in the skies above the metropolis, heralding the planet fall of more than just orbital debris. For now, unto Ithaca, came the arterial red gunships of the word-bearers, and the sinister configurations of ordo-reductor war crucibles. On the fields of Macro Alpha, a sterling testament to the character of the Legio Presagius was entered into history. Despite the apocalyptic fury of Sir Hervora, Despite their unprecedented casualties, the true messengers did not break, or even falter. Those engines that survived the initial barrage of their lines rallied with admirable speed and coherency, falling as quickly as they were able into a well-drilled Trinity Shield formation. A favored defensive tactic of the Legio, the alignment consisted of three maniples of five titans, each the heaviest surviving engines, forming a wedge formation. Void shields were brought to maximum, all spare reactor charge directed to their integrity and arranged to overlap with their fellow titans. Behind this shield wall, engines of lighter tonnage were gathered in order to protect them. The warhounds and reavers of the true messengers fell in behind the formation, led by a wall of as yet undamaged warlord class titans. An indomitable fortress under most any circumstances, save for the one they now found themselves in. Even the void shields of the warlords, powered to maximum integrity, were taking fire from a hundred engines, annihilation-grade barrage weaponry impacting them in unrelenting torrents. The ground itself was becoming vitreous due to the sheer heat of the incoming fire and its impacts upon the void shields the landing zone's tarmac steadily turning into cracked glass. With the entire Legio's senior cadre believed dead in the crash landing of the Arutan, command passed to Princeps Senioris Rico Trieste of the Warlord-class titan Auric Pegasus. Committed to the heart of the shield wall, 
Her assessment of the situation could not have been clearer. Her legio was hopelessly and fatally outgunned. Their enemies, erstwhile brethren of now hated Sir Tervora, continued to close, their motivators still recovering from the sheer speed of their initial advance, but no less implacable. Trieste knew that when the distance was closed, the slaughter would be final. The Firemasters were simply too many in number, and their broad, kilometers-wide battle line was primed to fully encircle the engines of Presagius. Her first, and indeed final, command as War Mistress of the Legio was issued with all possible haste. Those engines sheltering behind the shield wall, warmongers, reavers, direwolves, and warhounds, as well as a few heavily damaged warlords, were to immediately retreat at full stride into Ithrica proper and disperse. Cover was to be sought where at all possible, and all efforts bent towards the restoration of void shields and, laterally, weapon systems. The man-made ravines of the city were tall enough to conceal even Titan-class engines, which, coupled with the division of Legio Maniples, would hopefully serve to deprive Sertivora of its sheer numerical advantage. Nine warlords would buy their kin the time needed to accomplish this, including Auric Pegasus itself, mounting a full charge at the line of the Firemasters. Two never even made contact with their enemies, one torn to fragments by sustained fire, the other literally kneecapped by a volcano cannon strike and crashing to the ground. This latter warlord's carapace weaponry continued firing blindly for several seconds, stabbing into the tumultuous dust cloud its fall had thrown up until it was overrun. The remaining seven engines collided with their traitor foes with enough righteous fury to sunder their line, forcing Sertivora to prematurely stagger and close their encircling maneuver to compensate. The scorned ferocity of the true messenger served them well, as did the sheer power of their engines. A warlord titan motivated by pure hatred is no mean thing. And for the first time since the attack began, Presagius reaped vengeance from the traitors. It was, of course, an inevitably suicidal attack. One by one, the counter-attacking titans succumbed to the sheer numbers of the Firemasters. Accounts considered by some to be apocryphal, owing to the narrative satisfaction they carry, state that it was Auric Pegasus who survived the longest, beating back the enemy with the severed head of a Sertervora Reaver Titan clasped in its fist. The carapace weaponry were severed, ashen stumps. Its armor was beginning to flow like liquid under so many sustained melter weapon strikes. It and its fellow six warlords died, but did so with honor and success. Their counterattack had bought the rest of the Legio time enough to reach the cover of the city's core. Their names are forever etched into Legio memory, enshrined as the Nine Paragons of Ithrica, Auric Pegasus, Putarkos, the Lion of Mars, Chrysair's Wake, the Triumph of Akatran, Reason's Thunder, the Silver Thorn, Sabrus Reginum, and the Will of Adamant. This majority muster of the Legio was not alone in their miraculous retreat, Smaller subdivisions of the true messengers had mustered elsewhere in the macro landing zones. Some had suffered terribly. Battlegroup Peregrine was utterly annihilated by a fusion missile barrage from the Ordo Reductor in the upper atmosphere. But others were luckier. Battlegroup Argentus, with the Reaver Titan Invigilator at its fore, was saved from the bombardment by their proximity to the Legio Certervora's own muster site at the time of the attack. Under fire from the Firemaster's trailing elements, they had immediately retreated, desperately trying to raise calm links with their kin on the fields of Macro Alpha to no avail. Elsewhere, the armored squadrons and battle automata maniples of the Mechanicum's Tagmata Xerxes had also suffered minimal losses from the orbital strikes. Electing, in the face of what they had correctly discerned to be a massive engine-scale conflict, to fall back to an industrial zone in Ithrica's southern quarter, which embedded Magi and Myrmidons 
calculated as being the most defensible location within immediate reach. Traitor Auxilia, drawn from the Mordecai occlusion, attempted to intervene in the tag matter's retreat, but were, in a rare stroke of loyalist luck, completely outmatched. The occlusion was a string of feudal worlds, and, while outfitted with decently modern imperial weaponry, its regiments were ultimately lightly armed and armoured, driven primarily by word-bearer-aligned faith more than actual skill or leadership. The Mechanicum simply annihilated them, suffering nothing in the way of losses. Automata and Myrmidons carved a pitiless, clinical path through the traitor Auxilia, as knight suits secured their flanks, the heavier weaponry of the Scions deemed a waste of ammunition against such meager opposition. With these elements, and the remains of Presagius now disengaged and fortifying themselves within the depths of Ithrica, the initial phase of slaughter and destruction was concluded, but the Battle of Ithrica was far from over. As the conflict entered into its second hour, it took on a wholly different character. Presagius, now scattered and embedded in the artificial canyons of Ithrica, sought to use the towering Ferrocrete Hab and Administration Towers as cover to lay ambushes for the engines of Surtur Vora, while the Faramasters now brought the same murderous fury they had displayed on the landing fields to their destruction of the city, attempting, where possible, to lay waste to whole quarters in their efforts to flush their prey out. Counterattacks by the true messengers could only mitigate so much collateral damage as they sought to bring the foe to bear, and it was not long before the flashing plasma arcs, thundering apocalypse missile barrages, and howling shellfire began to lay utter waste to Ithrica. Towers were reduced to bullet-shredded corpses of their former selves before collapsing entirely, victims of the Titan battle. Dust clouds rapidly rendered all visibility entirely moot. This was an engine war, after all, fought in the realms of auspexes, decided upon by skill and tenacity of the sensori and their princeps. Midst all of this, crowds of civilians unable to previously escape fled in utter panic from the clashing giants. Thousands were caught in the torrents of Prometheum fire unleashed by Sertovora's favoured inferno cannons, flash incinerated to ashen ghosts. Reactor death of Titans irradiated whole city blocks in instants, their destruction only adding to that already reaped by weapons fire. A false night fell on Ithrica, a choking, toxic miasma of masonry dust and human ash. Through all this, the Presagius battlegroup Argentum, miraculous survivors from earlier, pressed through it all under the superlative leadership of the Reaver Invigilator. Outfighting and outmatching every foe they encountered, they were dogged in their pursuit of a singular goal, to reach the downed wreck of the mass conveyor Arutan, for within, the princeps of the Maniple bore hope that their salvation may yet live. In Ithrica's eastern sectors, the Kallak war host reigned supreme, the murderous advance still wholly unchecked, their death toll impossible to ever establish accurately. They were, finally, now opposed by the Ultramarines of the scattered 4th and 24th chapters. Squads and companies from these chapters had been subdeployed across the city, diverted and separated in what one must presume was a deliberately premeditated attempt to deny them coherency at the outset of the betrayal. Many of these subdivisions had been caught in the blast wave caused by the Helicon's destruction, and these survivors now rallied under knowledge far more grim. Their command elements had all been ensconced within the depths of the now annihilated command center. This did, however, provide all points with a mustering site. Desperately, all were seeking to access the massive subterranean network of bunkers that had formed the Helicon's foundations. The main site was simply a disaster. Any entranceways were now literally molten, rock flowing like liquid in the aftermath of the Ordo Reductor's dread tensions. Auxiliary access tunnels were slowly being opened, often by Mechanicum Adepts, our ultramarines taking direct enemy fire, 
and trapped Astartes below were being, painstakingly, rescued. The 13th Legion, however, could not simply ignore the rampages of the Kallak. This was both tactical exigency and moral duty. While defending the rescue operations was a consideration, the wanton murder of civilians, self-same civilians the Ultramarines were essentially sworn to protect and defend, led many squads to break away from the Helicon zones and seek retribution. In the eastern sector, a counterattack of unbridled fury slammed into the advancing Kallak. Just as the savagery of these auxilia had met little to no resistance in their slaughter of helpless innocents, so too were they now powerless against the Legion. Small arms fire pinged uselessly off power armor, just as their bayonets and ritual knives could find precious little purchase in cobalt battle place. The violence was astonishing, as anyone who has ever beheld Astartes facing baseline humans will ever attest to. The Kallax, overrun forward elements, almost entirely light infantry, were reduced to piles of viscera, severed limbs, and detonated bodies. It is a testament to the discipline of the Ultramarines that their desire for vengeance did not see them make the same mistake their foes had. When Kallak walkers and armor were encountered, tactical withdrawals were immediately ordered until heavier weaponry could be drawn up to further punish the traitors. The sheer malicious fury present amongst the nigh-rabid Kallak war host since their first atrocities in their barrack zones were now being documented amongst other traitor forces in the war zone. The Tagmata Xerxes recorded a marked uptick in baseline human auxilia hurling themselves at the Mechanicum defenses, seemingly without consideration for survival. Carefully delineated kill zones, methodically mapped out by the Tagmata's savants of destruction, became clogged with bodies. Yet still the waves and waves of soldiers came, heedless of losses, insensate in rapturous kill lust. So constant were these human deluges that the esoteric weaponry of the Mechanicum began to overheat, forcing the application of close-quarter combat protocols in carefully timed sequences, so that the Magi and Automata may preserve their ammunition supplies and weapons barrels. The potential source of the zealous lunacy was soon to reveal itself. Amongst the human masses now strode figures altogether more massive, the word bearers. The Astartes present at these engagements, thanks to rigorous Mechanicum data extraction, were documented as having quite non-standard upgrades to their power armor. Many bore what appeared to be votive censers, swinging on chains and vomiting forth clouds of hallucinogenic narcotic gases. Augmented helm speakers blared plain song or hymnals in languages unknown to the Tagmata, but the effect that these Astartes had amongst the unaugmented thralls was clear. Mathematically verifiable, even. Wherever they strode, the suicidal intensity of the auxilia was driven to even greater heights. Not only that, but the Astartes themselves were, of course, no slouches in combat, and had brought up field weaponry to match that of the Tagmata Xerxes. Significant damage was now being reaped upon the Mechanicum. Previously merely outnumbered, the Magi were now becoming outgunned forcing Retreat Algorithmica to plot withdrawal courses to hastily but exactingly constructed defensible positions. Not even the once noble engines of the Legio Certovora were spared from the murderous wrath, but the masters of the Titans did not seem to pay it any heed. Even their holy name appeared to be a thing of the past. Though the Legio was born of Mars herself, Ancient even by the standards of the Collegia Titanica, Ithraca was the moment they shocked that identity wholly. A new name was being blared across open vox lines, howled into the wind with a rage unbridled. Infernus. It was appropriate, on that damnable day more than any others. The Firemasters they now truly were. Inferno cannons incinerated city blocks with abandon, or deluged presagious engines with crawling, melting fury. 
As the hours of engine war ground on, Legio Infernus Titans seemed to abandon any tactical rigors of god-machine-scale conflict. They transformed, slowly but surely, into less of a coherent fighting force and more of a hort of gigantic beasts unleashed. Engines of the true messengers were hounded like wounded prey, but increasingly, Infernus Titans would abandon these pursuits in favor of glutting themselves upon the helpless humanity that fled from them in all directions. The methods employed in these slaughters had previously only been done so against non-compliant human regimes, or Xenos populations. Using the sheer overwhelming sonic power of the engine warhorns, the Titans drove people like livestock, deafened, their ears bleeding, herded into groups contained by the very architecture of the city, before engaging their inferno cannons and turning the screaming, begging humanity into cinders. Not one scrap of mercy was offered. The sheer horror of the murder was apparently the exact point. For the beleaguered engines of Presagius, the massacre of Ithaca's civilians granted them a degree of respite. Distracted Infernus engines were peeling away from pursuing them. Battlegroup Argentus, spared from obliteration, rounded upon the downed hulk of the Arutan, only to find their path barred by a hulking Nemesis Warbringer-class titan, accompanied by two warhounds. While not the demi-legio they had feared to discover gloating over the wreckage of the mass conveyor, the Nemesis outmatched any single engine in Argentus, who now steeled themselves for the fight of their lives. The Battle of Ithrica is almost unique upon Kalth, for being a war zone wherein no combatant held the upper hand for any significant stretch of time. During the betrayal, a status quo typically ended up establishing itself within the first hour of hostilities in favor of one side or another. This was, of course, overwhelmingly in favor of the traitors, possessing, as they did, total surprise and superiority. But loyalist victories did still exist. In Ithraca, no such decisive position was occupied for many, many hours. By the sixth hour of fighting, ultramarine reinforcements, drawn from the 17th and 18th chapters, had poured into the city via gunship and rhino transports. Having mustered far outside the metropolis's boundaries, these survivors nevertheless reckoned that Ithraca would provide a more defensible position than the empty scrubland surrounding it. It was no safe harbor, that much was certain, but it would, at the very least, provide cover from aerial strikes of word-bearers' Black Comet chapter flyers that had so punished them since the first wave of attacks. Additionally, Corpheron's control of the planetary defense grid had seen renewed orbital strikes targeting locations in the planet's southern hemisphere. Commanders of the 17th and 18th reasoned that, while in no way certain, the word-bearers were less likely to commit orbital fire on a war zone containing their own elements. In the depths of the ruined city, the remnants of the Ultramarine's fourth chapter had coalesced under the leadership of Captain Mantargo, who had led a heroic breakout from the subterranean bunkers with a sizable amount of his chapter's armor and artillery divisions. In a superlative tactical decision, the captain deployed his war machines on the high ground offered by the massive Trident Aqueduct. Its systems savaged by the war, it nevertheless had been built to withstand thousands of tons of water every second, making it the perfect platform for the armor of the 13th Legion. From here, Captain Mantargo was able to direct counter-battery fire at targets of opportunity across the entire metropolis. Although these efforts were limited by vox lines, constantly jammed with overlapping hymns and chants, so intense and garbled now that they resembled nothing less than constant primeval howling. At the sight of the downed Arutan, the nemesis titan Revoca had finally fallen, but only at great cost to battlegroup Argentus. The warlord class Evocatus and the warhound Deathrunner had been lost with all hands, while the commanding Reaver class Invigilator had suffered heavy damage, along with its two surviving kin. 
drawn by the fighting, almost the entirety of Prasagius's beleaguered legio had gathered in the city areas around the Arutan, rallying around the conveyor as on all sides they were pressed by the mad dogs of the reborn legio infernus. This was, however, no forlorn last stand. At such close proximity, the hopes of battle group Argentus were realized. Vox links had been raised. Engines yet lived within the holds of the Arutan. Survivors of the crash, contained within their god machines, but trapped within the massive bark. Void shields could not be activated, and though many may have sorely wished it, none had dared to activate weapons to cut their way out, for fear of detonating fuel lines, or worse, munition resupply bays. Legion tech marines, Skitarii overseers, and Mechanicum magi were frantically working to free the command echelon of the true messengers, even as titan-grade weapon fire barraged the gathering Presagius, voids wavering under such punishing barrages. Elsewhere, the tactical situation of the Tagmata Xerxes was growing ever more dire. Temporary relief had emerged in the form of attachment of knights from the stranded House Vornherr, but the traitor horde had only grown with the arrival of more and more word-bearers, and the emergence on their flanks of the Black and Crimson Siege Automata from the Ordo Reductor Covenant Mormoth Null, the heretic obliterators who had laid waste to the Helicon from the stratosphere. As the scions of Vornherr sallied forth against Thanatar battle robots and word-bearer heavy armor, the Magi of Xerxes worked furiously on a hastily ratified plan to reconfigure a large plasma reactor, the housing of which had become the site of their now seemingly final stand. At Kalthmark 06.36.04, the Tagmata Xerxes mounted a counterattack against their besiegers. A wedge formation of the Mechanicum's last Castellax class automata drove into the traitor host, using servo claws, blunt fists, and powered blades in favor of now spent firearms to tear through the poorly equipped cultic auxiliaries. Sent reeling by the scale of the counter assault, a moment was bought for three damaged but operational Thanatar siege robots to drag the modified reactor forth as fast as their hammering piston legs could carry their massive frames and the barely contained nuclear firebomb their magi had rigged. The zealot mob was seemingly oblivious to this, driving forth upon the automata with abandon. But what was about to transpire was no doubt obvious to some of the cannier word-bearers in attendance, and was certainly obvious to the captain of the Dirac's Lament, still holding in stationary position above the city. Archmagos Barbatos Hexad, Dominus of the Mormoth Null Covenant, registered the phenomenal and barely contained reaction immediately, and ordered his Ordo Reductor to withdraw from the field with all possible haste. It was, for the traitors, far too late. Logisticians amongst the Tagmata Xerxes had calculated the inevitability of their forces' destruction. The total loss of the Tagma was a mathematical inevitability dependent only upon timing and unpredictable factors beyond the reckoning of their statistics. Accordingly, the governing magi had enacted procedures of mutually assured destruction. The communion remotely detonated their device. An area half a kilometer in diameter was immediately atomized in plasmic fire, along with anything or anyone helpless enough to be contained within the sphere of atomic annihilation. The blast wave went on to consume 23 city blocks worth of territory, with a similar yield to that which had wiped out the Helicon, reducing anything living to dust and anything of metal to molten slag. It is illustrative of the sheer magnitude of the bombardment the Legio Presagius was weathering that the destruction of the Tagmata Xerxes went utterly unnoticed by the Titans guarding the Arutan. The half-dead Invigilator was now the sole engine of Argentus that remained standing, maimed, yes, but defiant. The sacrifice of its battle group was thankfully not in vain. At Mark 07.03.21, 
The massive assault door of the Arutan hit the earth with a near seismic force, unlocked at last by the valiant efforts of loyalist technicians. From within the cavernous hold of the conveyor strode forth the mightiest engines the true messengers possessed. At the fore was Immortalis Domitor, a warmonger-class Emperor Titan, fully twice the size of the two maniples of warlords that now walked alongside it. Their first volley simply annihilated the parklands in a three-kilometer radius of their targets, the initial volley destroying in an instant the Infernus Titans, Tyrant's Fist, Orias, Deus Vesago, and Consecratus Inferna. A single coordinated group under the command of the Legio's Princeps Maxima, the march of the true messengers was now unstoppable. Even with Vox rendered inoperable by the eldritch howling of the traitor communications, the princeps of Presagius utilized tried-and-true methods of warhorn signaling, short blasts forming robust signals of advance, defense, and targeting. The blood-mad frenzy of their foes, both the Legio Infernus and their human auxiliaries, simply fell before the precision and discipline of the true messengers. The titanic advance spared the harried ultramarine companies, allowing them an opportunity to consolidate their forces, and for the first time in hours, aid in the coordination of evacuation efforts, hurrying what civilians had managed to survive the apocalypse unleashed upon their city into the largely secured subterranean routes to the arcologies far below ground. These efforts, though paltry in comparison to the death toll, should not go unnoticed. The first dread notice of what was to occur came with the sudden and total silence of the Vox Lions. The howling that had blanketed Ithrica for hours suddenly simply was not. For an instant, quiet reigned, until it was followed by another surge of calm traffic this time from Loyalist units attempting to establish whatever they could of the broader tactical picture. Every possible request nigh jammed the lines. Pleas for medical aid, demands for command authority confirmation, requests for situation reports, simple pleas to know why the Imperium's own had turned upon them. Above all this, shunted into the highest priority bands, came a call from the Legio Presagius Warhound engine, Lecadrio. The Scout Titan had been dispatched to the last known location of the Tagmata Xerxes, who had proven impossible to raise on Vox, for reasons obvious to us in this historical record. Shielded as it was against the intense radiological fallout of the devastated industrial zones, Lecadrio had discovered not simply a smoking blast crater, but a horrific forest of twisted metalwork raised to host thousands of charred, but clearly human, corpses, pinned in place as if by some predatory avian. The arrangement of these spars, in concentric circles, was so clearly not the artifice of any weapon system known, and the Scout Titan's auspex grids were so overloaded with contradictory life sign readings that it raised its Legio's leader immediately to deliver the report, but was cut off shortly thereafter. Attempts to contact it, both by the princeps of Immortalis Domitar and several Ultramarines Damocles Rhinos nearby, were met with failure for the next several minutes, until a garbled, heavily distorted Vox burst was received and routed for all to hear. The snippets spoke of a figure. Not a titan, but taller than one, winged, skin blood-red, armor of beaten brass, surrounded by a blood fog. It spoke that their void shields had failed, that their armor had been compromised, that, that, that their souls must be commended to the Omnissiah, that save us. Then, silence. There is little in the way of a concrete narrative that can actually summarize the final hours of the Battle of Ithraca. The eighth hour had been ushered in with the death of Lecadrio. 
What was recovered in the aftermath is a scrambled mess of Legio Prosagius lithocorders, Legion as Astartes helm logs, Ordo Reductor cogitator banks, and Legio Cybernetica necrocortical implants. It is, all of it, fundamentally corrupt and unreliable, even by the standards of records saved from Calth following the atrocity. As for eyewitness testimony, the battle had pitifully few survivors. And one's acolytes should be well aware at this point of the mimetic hazards posed by testimony of those who witnessed what they did. This is one of the reasons mentioned at the outset of this particular chapter of the Betrayal of Kalth that Ithraca presaged in so many ways the battles of the Age of Darkness. A rising intensity of horror and destruction that would end with the sundering of all that was known. What can be verified is that, at the outset of the eighth hour of battle, several localized rifts in corporeal reality occurred within the city's limits. The tears, ruptures in the skine that separates materia from immateria, our world from the warp, provided vectors from which the predatory entities of that realm, the Neverborn, those without the ken to realize the words power will call demons, flooded into the mortal plane. The largest of these schisma occurred at the site of the Tagmata Xerxes' destruction, while others emerged at seemingly random sites around the metropolis, its industrial zones, its muster yards. Scholars of the Damned have noted, of course, that these sites were likely far from actually random. Rather, they had been locations where the slaughter had been the greatest, the most vile, or the most possessive of narrative significance. The sheer scale and malignancy of the murder performed by the Legio Infernus and the Kallak Warhost was now given dreadful, tangible purpose. It was ritual, its significance on a scale hitherto unseen by the Imperium of Man. Against the torrent of immaterial entities that emerged from these portals, there was no preparedness. Their nature was utterly unknown to the Loyalists, even the most senior of Ultramarines commanders or Legio Presagius princeps. At best, they would have been aware that predatory Xenos, unstudied by humanity, existed within the warp. Had they been, whatever vomited forth from the rents in reality bore absolutely not one shred of resemblance to whatever prosaic, heavily redacted account they had read. Their forms were a cacophony of malevolence, tidal waves of verminous things, capering half-forms in mockery of humanity, hybrid animalia with too many mouths, gibbering uncreations of eyes and fire, bestial monstrosities in the aspects of legion soldiery. Their sizes were as diverse and insane as their forms, but amongst them strode incarnations the size and equal of the god engines that had ruled the battle zone for hours. Some plunged from the sky the color of bruises made of loss, enveloping enemy titans, loyalist titans, sundering them in fell swoops. At the Avaris Plaza, the reaver titan Nosos was recorded on legionary helm vids, being crushed by a gaseous emanation that resembled nothing less than a cloud of serpents who coiled around the proud engine to its end. The 312th Solar Auxilia were torn to shreds by half-incarnated things hooting as they rode bladed chariots through their ranks. The attacks of the Neverborn were not restricted to merely loyalist ranks, or to the slaughter of remaining civilians. The Ordo Reductor Coven of Mormoth Null were beset by the bale fire and toothed maws of lesser emanations, fleeing for their dropships to evacuate to the Dirac's Lament far above. Traitor Auxilia likewise perished, some in religious rapture, but many, many more weeping in terror and insanity. Only the word-bearers were spared the attentions of the emanations, passing through their immaterial ranks untouched. On the aqueduct of the Trident, the previously entrenched Ultramarines' fourth company were plagued by a threat from within, 
as from the body of a captive word-bearer, incarnated a massive never-born creature, canine in aspect, but with monstrous wings, a body the size of an imperial knight, and its coming brought great slaughter. Its size only grew as it killed and killed and killed, until its destruction was brought by a strafing run of fire raptor gunships. The incident bears further parallels with a similar incarnation elsewhere on Kalth, several similar incarnations, in fact, where, in identical scenarios, near identical creatures emerged, all of which were reported to have been chanting the same word. This word has, of course, been removed from this record for cognito hazard reasons, as all archival menials committed to confirming its validity died in the process. One must assume that this Neverborn is part of one of their wicked gestalt emanations, vestigial fingers of some wicked hole contained beyond the veil, yet grasping through it. Although ultimately overcoming this emanation, the encounter, and what he had been able to glean of the beyond dire tactical picture, convinced Captain Mantargo of the Ultramarines that not only could victory at Ithraca simply not be claimed, but that even their deaths would inflict negligible damage upon their foes. By the thirteenth hour of the Battle of Ithraca, the captain had sounded a general evacuation order, having discerned he was possibly the last surviving higher authority within the devastated city. The order was quickly taken up in the northern sectors, which had been spared much of the rampages of the Kallak war host, and thus the Neverborn incursions. Elsewhere, Macro-gamma landing fields became a helpful escape vector. They had been spared the initial orbital strikes owing to their status as a traitor mustering point, and now served as an embarkation point for surviving Loyalist flyers and overland transports. In the southern and eastern reaches of the city, however, the order went essentially unheeded. Not out of disobedience, far from it, but simply because any human or Astartes alive within those parts of Ithaca were far too occupied fighting for their very survival to even contemplate a withdrawal. The enemy was numberless, their forms limitless. They obeyed no law of the world physical. Weapons ceased to function against them. Just as how the situation aboard the McCrag's Honor had overwhelmed the ultramarine capacity for practical application of theoretical rules of warfare, the greater and lesser emanations of the Dark Powers made full use of their stunned foe's inability to combat them, and the orgy of violence that descended upon Ithraca was of a kind unheard of in the annals of Imperial history. Redolent instead of ancient Terran wood carvings and madman folk tales of the darkest depths of the Age of Strife. No record exists of survivors from these theatres of the Battle of Ithraca. They have been assumed, as far as history can establish, to have all simply died, torn to shreds by capering never born. Only the testimony of those few true messengers who survived give any hint as to the fate of the Legio Presagius. Even though scant handful only lived through the calamity in hopelessly crippled engines that staggered to some degree of relative safety, being rescued by other Imperial armed forces in the aftermath, abandoning their god machines to silent death. It is likely that, once the situation became clear, once the very gates of hell itself had been thrown open and madness reigned, the Legio knew that their dozen or so surviving titans could simply not escape. The Arotan was going nowhere, little more than a smoking husk at this point. The only titan-capable landers were those of Infernus at landing field Macro Beta, to which even now the Firemasters were retreating to, lest they suffer the attentions of their never-born allies. The Lords of the True Messengers knew that, even if they were somehow capable of staging a breakout action and making it to the scrubland surrounding Ithraca, they would be exposed wholly, left to the whims of aerial or orbital strikes. The fate Presagius resigned themselves to was clear. A last, futile fighting stand against the hordes of war emanations, 
that they in their actions may buy time for humans or Astartes elements to flee. It is unlikely that they knew or could have known the degree to which they succeeded. It is unlikely that they cared. Theirs was not of a character that required such flattery. Duty to Presagius was the only reward that was needed. Not a single titan of the Legio survived the Battle of Ithraca. It is, however, estimated that through their sacrifice, some 4,000 ultramarines were able to escape the doomed metropolis, living to fight on against the tides of darkness that were yet to come. By Mark 21.00.00, it could be considered a safe statement that many of the survivors of Kalth had resigned themselves to death under the light of the Viridian Star. It should not be taken as a surrender to melancholy, indeed far from it. The Astartes of the 13th Legion Ultramarines continued to comport themselves with the utmost discipline and dedication, relentlessly applying themselves to the immediate practicalities of their situations, but for many their fates now seemed clear. Whatever recompense they were to earn would be bought from the enemy in blood and destruction, and they would count it good. All, however, was not lost. The battle was not yet won by the traitorous 17th Legion and their allies. As one has elucidated upon previously, the word bearers, despite being in a position of near total tactical and strategic superiority from the very moment of their betrayal, had, at least in base military terms, squandered this position in favor of their pursuit of matters altogether more esoteric. While the full extent of these eldritch machinations were yet to birth, it had allowed the 13th Legion an iota of room to regroup, reinforce, and begin to plan. The Ultramarines, of course, were led by one of the greatest planners in Imperial history, and Robot Gulliman, recovered now from his imprisonment in the thin atmospheric shell surrounding his flagship, was striving to develop the situation into something that would deliver his legion from annihilation. The key to victory, or perhaps more accurately, the key to survival past the next several hours, lay in the usurped planetary defense grid. The thousands of weapons emplacements, both on the planet's surface and in orbit, had been captured by the word bearers earlier in the battle, and turned by the traitor Mechanicum to the command of Kor Phaeron. Since then, the first captain of the 17th Legion had wielded the grid not only to punish ultramarine orbital and ground forces, but to murder the entire Viridian system. While slaved to traitor control, no significant muster of force could be managed by the Ultramarines, as Corferon would immediately retask the grid to punish and annihilate. Thanks to Marius Gage's recapture of the McCrag's Honor's secondary bridge, Gilliman was able to coordinate planning with the largest Loyalist force that had established contact from the surface, that of 4th Company Captain Remus Ventanus. Ventanus had, during the course of the battle, linked up with Mir Edvd Torin, who was believed to be the most senior surviving Mechanicum adept on Kalth. From Torin, the captain, and latterly his Primarch, had learned that a data engine, potentially the only one on Kalth not infected by pernicious scrap code, lay within the Lanshir Guild Hall. This engine would allow Loyalist Mechanicum to re-establish the new sphere, and thus control over Kalth's networked weapons emplacements. But this would only be possible if control was also taken from the Data Overseer engine currently being used by the word bearers to command the grid. This engine locus was currently in Zetsun Verid Yard, the last surviving orbital shipyard, and the base of operations for Kor Phaeron. The attack on Zetsun Verid would be led by Gilliman himself. While the Primarch acknowledged that his role was as a general, not a warrior, he nevertheless stated to Marius Gage that he would not allow any of his sons to deny him the satisfaction of killing the first captain of the word bearers with his own hands. 
Ventanus' attack began with a rapid advance in force into the ruins of Lanshire City. The formations he possessed were heterogeneous, a diverse mix of imperial military elements. The majority was of the captain's own 4th Company survivors, supported by Solar Auxilia, Exertus Regiments, and Mechanicum Tagmata elements under Majos Torren and Scitarii Marshal Aruk Serutit. It was a motley assortment of survivors, to be sure, swept up into Ventanus's mission by sheer luck and fate. The remnants of the Neride Tenth marched alongside Mechanicum Tech Priests under the massive bulk of Shadow Sword Super Heavy Tanks, while at the vanguard, Ventanus led a wing of 13th Legion Land Raiders. Their first detected opposition was also their first kill, a sole Warhound Scout Titan of the Legio Mortis. The engine was alone and unsupported. Its princeps had clearly been granted leave to indulge their darkest destructive fantasies on Lanshire City, and for this, they would pay. Despite pushing its void shields to maximum, the Warhound's force bubble popped under a hurricane of fire from Predator, Whirlwind, and Sikaran tanks, before a pinpoint strike from a Shadow Sword ended its wretched existence. The portentous engine kill marked the start of the engagement. Ventanus's forces fell upon the word-bearer defenders of the Guildhall with the fury of the betrayed. Ultramarine discipline and cohesion kept barely in check in the face of a fury most righteous. Word-bearer Gal Vorbach reaped a fearsome tally from the attackers, but the rage of Ultramar would not be denied. Ventanus's forces captured the Guildhall and delivered the Mechanicum to their work. The success was buoyed by the arrival of new allies. The 111th and 112th companies, bereft of their command cadres, had been led to the guild hall by a single sergeant named Anshees, while Captain Athon of the 19th company, so-called the Honored, also arrived. A whole mortal host soon, too, made their presence known, led by ultramarine tetrarch Ikos Lamiad, as well as the Honored Dreadmark Telemachus. The reprieve, welcome as it was, would be short-lived. Auspex feeds registered a massive inbound enemy force, led by Hall Belloth. Despite the Mechanicum's possession of the data engine, the corresponding overseer engine in Zetsun Verid had yet to be freed from word-bearer control. Unless it was, the efforts of Ventanus's companies would be for nothing, and Hall Belloth's word-bearers would annihilate them within the hour. Yet in orbit, the second half of the 13th Legion's desperate gambit was now underway. Gilliman himself led a teleport assault from the McCrag's honor to the Zetson Verid orbital. The flagship could in no way risk movement for fear of alerting the weapons grid. So dangerous a maneuver was now the only one left at the Primarch's disposal. The sheer range of the teleport would draw so much power from the ship and shunt so much of it through the ancient systems that they would surely overload, rendering extraction by this method impossible. It was a final gambit, and was understood as such. Failure would see the Primarch dead, Kalth lost, and the Legion nigh exterminated. The risk was the only course possible for Gilliman. Without control of the weapons grid, his Legion would simply die regardless. It was only a matter of time. The battle between the Primarch and the Master of the Faith was unlike anything hitherto seen in the Age of Darkness. Corfeiron had ascended to becoming a debased magister of the powers of the Warp. He had drunk deep from the cups of sorcerous might, and the full scale of his present abilities were unleashed upon Gilliman as soon as the Ultramarines attacked the command center. Invested with the responsibility by Lorgar himself for the Kalth operation, Corfeiron withheld nothing, blasting Astartes to ash with warp-spawned maledictions, before turning upon Gilliman himself. Even the Primarch was rendered near helpless before the sorcery of the Master of the Faith. Driven to his knees by a beam of blackest unlight, Gilliman was sprung upon by Corfeiron, who pressed the blacked flint of an athame to his throat. 
This cursed dagger was one of the eight shards of the Anathema Blade, forged by the Xenos Kinebrak and stolen by Wordbearer's first chaplain Erebus at the outset of the Interrex Crisis. The selfsame blade had been used to mortally wound Horus Lupercal upon the moons of Davin, delivering the Primarch to that world's sinister lodge priests for care. Its new blasphemous children had been wielded by several individuals throughout the Battle of Kalth, and one was now poised to reap the life of a Primarch. However, at the exact moment when the killing blow could have been struck, Corfaeron stayed his hand, instead choosing to whisper into Gilliman's ear an offer he had no authority to make, yet did so regardless. Faeron promised Gilliman a place within the works of primordial annihilation, a place of great honor amongst the ranks of the Dark Pantheon's followers. All the 13th Primarch had to do was pledge himself to the worship and devotion of Chaos. But for his word, the Master of the Faith offered him a place within a new universal order, and all the power that came with it. Gilliman said nothing. His armored fist cannoned into Kor Faron's torso. The 13th Primarch's response to the sibilant offer was to tear Kor Faron's still beating heart from his body and cast its ruin upon the cold metal deck. At the Lanshire Guildhall, salvation began to rain from the heavens. In blinding columns, lance beams seared planetward, but they did not impact the beleaguered defenders. The might of the Kalth defense grid was turned instead upon the traitor host, and in an instant, extinction had been turned to retribution. An immediate, planet-wide counterattack was mounted on every major word-bearer force currently operational. Orbital strikes rained hell upon the traitor hosts, punishing each and every one in extremis. Still reeling from the wrath of the defense grid, these forces were now set upon by vengeful loyalists, Astartes, Mechanicum, Exertus units rising up against their attackers in near unison. This was not just merely upon the surface. In orbit, word-bearer ships that had ruled Kalth near space unchallenged now had the weapons grid turned against them. The platforms had been designed to fend off a threat approximate to a full battle fleet in proper standing order. The scattered word-bearer ships, which for a near full day had been gleefully hunting helpless targets of opportunity, were now annihilated in kind. Vessels of the 17th Legion that had centuries of service perished in instants, torn into by the unbridled fury of the weapons grid. Still choked with the carcasses of the Ultramarine's Grand Fleet, those perished loyalists in orbit were joined by the wreckage of their attackers. The sheer volume of debris the 13th Legion counterattack now added to would create an artificial set of rings for Kalth, the planet becoming encircled with the corpses of those ships that had fallen in the Great Betrayal forevermore. On the bridge of the Infidus Imperator, it is known that Corferon manifested shortly into the counterattack. Still somehow alive in the aftermath of having his heart torn from his chest, it is believed the Master of the Fate survived through sheer mastery of warpcraft. He was, however, apparently in no fit state to issue commands. It was the shipmaster of the 17th Legion craft, Antonius Antwark, that ordered the vessel's disengagement from the battle, reasoning that their contributions to the betrayal and its arcane significance had been accomplished within reasonable parameters. The Infidus Imperator came about and made full burn for the nearest Mandeville point. Aboard the Macrag's honor, its flight was immediately spotted by the Sensorium Adepts and reported to Marius Gage, who in turn raised his victorious Primarch on Zetsun Verid. Absolutely unwilling to allow the ship, and presumably Kor Faeron, to escape, Gilliman ordered Gage to mount an immediate pursuit aboard the Honor. Both vessels vanished into an unknown warp disturbance 
at the edge of the system. Their fates would remain unknown for years to come. Gilliman himself would not learn of the fate of his flagship, his first chapter master, or his loathsome enemy for quite some time. And indeed, the full tale of this insane clash must be reserved for another record. Although the Ultramarines had mounted a stunning last-minute reversal of fortune, this was not victory by any means. A delegation of counselors, led by a group of Mechanicum adepts, surviving fleet navigators, and clearly traumatized astropaths, petitioned Gilliman for time, for dire portents had emerged that required the Primarch's immediate attention. The Viridian Star had, during the hours of the weapons grid being in word-bearer hands, been explicitly targeted by the 17th Legion, along with the remaining stellar bodies in the system that they had murdered. Likely through the use of specialized ammunition, the traitors had inflicted horrific damage to the star's fusion reaction. Whatever they had seeded into its mass, it had caused Viridia to begin outputting increasingly lethal levels of radiation. The poisoned solar winds were now beginning to pummel Kalt's atmosphere, which had already been grievously wounded by almost a full Terran day of continual weapons bombardment and atomic attacks. Not only were its tectonics irreversibly impacted, the sheer amount of smoke unleashed by firestorms that still raged across its continents were choking the skies. The combined effects, the Mechanicum avowed, would, within days, render the planet's surface utterly inviolable for human life. With full evacuation from the planet impossible due to the sheer lack of Legion vessels still operational, not to mention the time involved, the only recourse was the withdrawal of all Loyalists still alive upon Kalth to the subterranean arcologies. The planet was rich with a network of tunnels through its porous crust. During its development, many of these had been turned into arcologies, underground cities connected and linked with future expansions already planned. While far from ideal, they were well suited to immediately absorb all surviving civilians, Astartes, and other humans and could provide at least some shelter from the fury of the now-poisoned Viridian Star. Captain Ventanus volunteered to lead this operation without hesitation. His fate now seemingly irrevocably bound to the planet, the Master of the Fourth Company announced over every open Vox channel that this was a Primarch's directive. The fleet, or what remained of it, would embark to what craft they could the remaining surface armor units, as well as what god engines of the Collegia Titanica were still operational. Even as this was being conducted, the navigators and astropaths of the Legion brought the Primarch yet more dire news. Pleas for aid from across the entirety of Ultramar. Kalth, it appeared, was the beginning of a much larger conflict. The 500 worlds were being assailed by, according to reports, not merely the word-bearers, but the 12th Legion world-eaters, and their Primarch, Angron. Dozens of systems and Ultramarines forces were reporting the same dire situation. This was no less than a full-scale invasion. Kalth, Gilliman grimly surmised, had merely been an opportunity to exterminate the bulk of the Ultramarines Legion, allowing the traitors to then conquer and reeve nigh unopposed through the jewels of the Eastern Fringe. In this, they had essentially failed. The Legion and its liege were very much alive, and could be rallied, but the price they would pay, and had paid, was undoubtedly dire. Almost 120,000 Ultramarines lay dead, with a further 20,000 crippled and in dire need of Medicaid care. In many ways, the word-bearers had succeeded. It could hardly be argued that they had not. The final piece of information for Gilliman was altogether more difficult to comprehend in scope, but no less pressing for it. The navigators were reporting that the currents of the warp were becoming extremely restive. The tides of the immaterium in significant flux. For whatever reason, these disturbances were centered around Kalth, 
and the Viridian system. At best estimate, the fleet's navigators surmised that the system would become cut off from the wider galaxy by an oncoming storm of unprecedented power, and that the storm may in fact be spreading outwards. Already capricious this past year, the rising warp instability sealed Gilliman's course for him. Once the final units could be embarked from the surface, those warp-capable ships would flee the system. At Kalth Mark 23.43.00, Remus Ventanus glimpsed to the surface of the world that he suspected would be his very last time. Loyalist Mechanicum elements, mostly the remnants of Archmagos Karn Barbarel's Tagmata, took the brunt of the final phases of the retreat, far more resilient as they were to the effects of increasingly debilitating radiation. Unfortunately for the Loyalists, the traitor forces still alive upon Kalth had read the signs, and had heard Ventanus's proclamation. Where possible, significant elements of word-bearers likewise retreated to the Arcologies. This marks the beginning of the Underground War, a near decade of conflict that would only conclude with the defeat of the traitors on Terra and the end of the Horus Heresy. Betrayal at Kalth did not conclude in the manner of other battles in the Age of Darkness. Not only was the Underground War its dreadful successor, continuing the battles on the planet years after the initial shock of perfidy, the unfolding Shadow Crusade saw Gilliman immediately engaged as soon as the evacuation force made wake. Kalth's tale is the tale of the heresy itself. The last of the 17th Legion was not purged from its tunnels until the fall of the War Master. The Mark of Kalth itself was kept running by the 13th Legion until approximately Mark 219,479.25.03, during the scouring, when Captain Ventanus, hero of the Underground War, led the Ultramarines to Colchis the home world of the word-bearers and Lorgar. With them, they brought death. A planet for a planet was scant recompense. Like the continued running of the Mark, it was a thing of symbolism and little else. Of course, the purging of a warp-tainted population was a matter of significance in the years of the Scouring, but the real heft of the matter lay in the base revenge of the act. Symbols, as the Imperium had learned during the Horus Heresy, carried significant weight. The crimes of Lorgar and his legion could not be repaid in the simple death of one world, but Colchis's destruction yet mattered. For the word-bearers themselves, some scholars have speculated that the Mark of Kalth may yet still run, in the depths of the Great Eye or the Maelstrom the countless pockets of blackest treachery to which their craven kind ran. The Mark too was not merely that of Ultramarine's battle records, or the obsession of the word-bearers while the Legion still lives. Colloquially, the Mark of Kalth was the name ascribed to severe radiation burns suffered by the survivors of the betrayal that was caused by the poisoned light of the Viridian Star. The scarring was distinct and in many cases quite serious, but veterans of the battle would often forgo skin grafts and Medicaid procedures, wearing them as a grim badge of honor. The Mark II also refers to psychological damage endured by those who had survived the treachery of the word-bearers. The trauma of the attack was significant enough to brand itself onto even the psycho-conditioned minds of the Legiones Astartes. Survivors of the massacres formed groups apart from fellow legionaries who had, by virtue of chance, simply not been present at the conjunction. In the broader context, Kalth presaged the Wars of the Age of Darkness in ways that would only become evident in dread retrospect. While it was perhaps the last, grand, full-scale display of the sheer surprise of concealed treachery, 
The utter devastation of civil war between imperial military forces was now writ large upon the scarred, rent surface of an entire, fully populated imperial world. A star system had been murdered in the space of a day. Billions lay dead in less than 24 hours. This was one system, one world. The battlefield to come was galactic in scale. Until such a time as one may relate further tales of this benighted epoch. Ave Imperator. Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash Oculus Imperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.